There you go. You're live now. Okay. Sure. Hank, should I go up? I call this. Hello? Hello? Check, check, check. Test, test. Hello? Check, check, check. Test, test. Let's see. I see Jeff, but I don't hear anything. Hear anything at all? Hmm. Something's not working correctly for me. Sound check works. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. Hello. Can you hear me? I can't hear anybody on your side if you can hear me. Um, gee, it, we have some audio problems again. This is unfortunate. Our test did not have any of this issue. I don't know if you folks can hear me. No. Okay. I can't hear you. Well, I'm going to disconnect and try this again. Hello? Anybody hear me? Great. Mark. Mark. Good morning, Mark. Can you hear me? James? How are you? No. Okay, just give it a check. Good morning, Jeff. Good morning, Jeff. Yeah. Okay. 
Can you hear me? Hey, I can hear you, Jeff. Can you hear me? All right. Looks like we solved the problem. Weird one. What is that? Okay. Okay, Jeff, can you hear me now? I can hear you. One thing that is strange is it doesn't allow me to type questions into the question box on my control panel. I've never had that problem before this meeting. Okay, we'll check that. I, I'm wondering if other people that are on the line might be able to do that. Uh, Mark, I think you were also, I heard you earlier, I don't know if you can type questions into the question box, but it appears I cannot. Well, um, I am having trouble getting um, my hardware here to accept my headset. It keeps through my laptop speakers. Normally this works for me. But... Um, I will uh, try to log in again. Uh, one other quick comment, Arden. Uh, where you're sitting, you're you're you know right in the center of the room. I'm, if you could shift over a little bit, we're just kind of looking at the uh, the the light coming out of the projector. I'm not sure if you could shift over just a little bit to eliminate that. Maybe not. But it'll work. Yes, there's a glare coming out. Yeah, if you, if you move two or three seats down, but you might not be able to do that because of power cords or something. So if it's an option, great. If not, don't worry. Actually, reorienting it the way you did might be a little better, Hector, because then you can see more seats. Yeah, right there. Now you can see more seats in the room. Yeah, I'm just walking around the room. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you good. Hi. Excellent. Oh. <laughs> Let's see. I see Sparky's there. Hey, Jeff. Good morning. Good morning, man. Come on. Come on. You gotta join us in there. Come on. No, no. Come on. We need you. Hello. Hello. Okay, I'm going to dial into the. Hey, hey Mark, just uh, while you're here, while we're setting up, uh, uh, I did get you added to that invitation list on Facebook. So if you uh, get a chance, to check out that uh, page for the event. Yeah. 
want to make sure that uh, my audio connections are working. I was definitely having some problems trying to use the headset through the computer, but now I'm dialed into a phone and it seems to be working. And Mark, when you were on uh, your audio problems there, I just mentioned that I got you added to that event page on Facebook, so do check it out. There's a lot of info there. Okay. Yeah, I, I've, used, uh, I've used GoToMeeting many times. But this time it definitely behaved differently from the past. <laughs> I don't know. The same for me too. Um, I had some interesting glitches, but I logged off and logged back on, and it seemed to solve the problem. Yeah, I've tried it twice. <laughs> oh well, uh, I've got a system that's working. I'll just stick with it.
Challenge that we're trying to overcome as a group, I believe. Hi, and uh, that question has come up every time, and Craig has been the only one at uh, the presentation made about the only one actually answered correctly, and, and communication is key here. And I think uh, that we're doing a, a tremendous job um, communicating here during our meetings and offline. There's tremendous progress being made in, in the work groups. And, uh, and it's all comes down to communication. It's just everybody kind of loosening up, trusting each other, being able to have those conflicting discussions, and, that, and but always keeping the big picture in mind that we're not the purpose of the group is not with individual purposes. But the purpose of the group is you know the much bigger picture, what's impacting industry, and how we can feel those yeah, can feel those voice and, and answer those questions. So before we move on to uh, the introductions. I just want to uh, thank Paula. You guys all know Paula. She's doing a, a tremendous job. Uh, all the communications, the hundreds of emails, and keeping everybody together and informed. So thank you very much, Paula. You're doing an awesome job. You are helping. Now, Joe Biden thanked me last week. Thank you. 
<laughs> uh, introductions, we have a, a couple new members, so when we go around the room and online, you introduce yourself. And if you don't mind, you know, Roy is new, and, and Jim, you're, you didn't come to our last meeting? I did. You did. Uh, if you can just say a couple words by yourself, not just your name, who you represent. Uh, if you want to share something personal, your favorite movie, book, whatever, that'll be fantastic so we can get to know you a little bit more. Uh, so let's go around the room and start with Chris. First, uh, Chris Byron. I run the design engineering and our R&D teams for Varengo Solar. Um, been in solar for about 10 years, came all the way through custom home building. Um, I worked for Sun Edison for a period and, and everything in between. So happy to be part of the committee and, and figure out how to get this thing ironed out. Great. Thank you. Jim Cahill with Solar City. I'm the regional vice president. John Tacker, UL. I'm Jim Bailey, LA County Fire Department. I'm in charge of the engineering section. Uh, all the plan reviews for all these sources will go through our section. By the way, that's well, the short. You'll know me, Paula. Cindy Maycomber, Canada Gas Electric Service. Hi, Roy Allen. Actually, I got the uh, I got volunteered into this at FBI. Where I'm not really sure how it happened because I was just there to get somebody key. I, I wasn't even part of FBI. But, <laughs> but you know, I just sure are. Huh? Seriously, uh, I'm with ABB, and, and uh, I, I guess I do hold the new record for ABB in terms of uh, long-term employment of of uh, solar personnel between between Power One and ABB. I'm 15 years. Uh, and the industry, which is power supplies and solar and so on and so forth. And currently, I'm a technical support engineer for uh, ABB Renewable Energy. Glad to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. I'm Sparky Cohen. I'm the building official for Calabasas, and that's typically how I've been announcing myself. But I do want to add, you know, I'm going to have to start dovetailing some of my efforts in. I'm also the inspection committee chairman for the LA Basin chapter of ICC. I'm also the inspection committee chairman for the Ventura region of ICC. And currently, we're, our goal for the year has been to come up with training for the combination inspectors. So now that I really see an end zone in sight with where this committee's headed, I'm really excited to start tying the efforts of the uh, inspection committees into this group. I'm Sunny Dye with Intertech ETL. Seth Isaac, the Federal State of Los Angeles. Seth McCashee, LA County. Mark has just walked in. Senior for Sustainable Energy. Welcome. Online, what do we have? Uh, I'm Craig Carney. I'm the Chief Technology Officer and Founder of Iron Ridge. Happy to be part of this group. Thank you, Craig. Jeff, Spee Jeff Spee's here with uh, Quick Mount PV, and I'm also uh, with Kelsia and their Chairman of their Codes and Standards Committee. Hello, this is Mark Balbaceri from Enphase Energy. Hello, Mark. Hi, it's Richard Lawrence. Hi, Richard. Richard Lawrence, uh, Executive Director at NABSEP, North American Board of Certified Energy Practitioners. Thank you, Richard, for joining us. I'm Tom Coffey. I'm with uh, Iron Ridge. I'm relatively new to solar, been involved for about four years now. Uh, I got my start in utility construction as a site manager, linked up with Iron Ridge uh, about a year ago. I've um, been helping develop the uh, technical support side of things over there, and uh, glad to be a part of the committee. Welcome. Ron, Ron Mulek, uh, Solartronics is a uh, solar installation firm. <clears throat> I also have a construction company, Mulek Construction and Design, and the chairman of the, Cal, uh, the Los Angeles chapter of Calcia. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, hi, this is Alan Fields with Sungevity uh, out of the Design and Engineering Department. Hello, Alan. Hey, Don, are you, are you there? Yep, Don Hughes, uh, Center for Sustainable Energy, is on the line. Okay. <laughs> he sounds so excited. So quiet. I'm really shocked so I'm quiet, really quiet, Don. <laughs> yes. Don, are you, are you by the pool in Miami somewhere, or Florida? What are you doing? I'm intentionally not sharing my webcam because I'm sitting at the pool, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I 
happens to you. You're getting some solar, huh? Okay, very good. Well, thank you all. Thank you all for coming. Paula, what are you doing? Uh, yes. Um, I'm going to run through it really quickly because we have uh, um, Joseph here from PRG who wants to give a pre uh, presentation and he's got to head, head off to a meeting. So I'll run through the announcements pretty quickly. Um, obviously, we all know we've got a new member, Roy Allen. Thank you so much. Um, great to have you on the team. You're going to really enjoy it. Um, we also have a new SIAC uh, operations uh, staff member, and her name is Stephanie Yen. Thank oh, Stephanie, you didn't introduce yourself. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you. <laughs> so Stephanie will be helping on administration, which will be great. Thank you so much. Um, we have Richard Lawrence online, and he's going to um, give a presentation and an overview on NAPSEP a little bit later in the agenda. Uh, thank you, John, Dr. Sunny Ray, who will also be doing um, presentations a little bit later on UL2703, a hot topic. And uh, to any of you here on the floor or online, if there's any announcements from you, please go ahead. Any announcements? Anybody? Okay. All right, so then Joseph, you're going to... Uh, Joseph is from PRG and the public, public relations group who's been working on our PAG logo the last uh, two months. Um, and uh, he's here to talk us through um, how we've evolved to the logo that we have. He's been very patient with Hector and I. Thank you so much, Joseph. Good morning, uh, everybody here and online. Um, if you're not here, we just let me know. I can interject uh, a little more. Like I said, uh, Paula mentioned that Hector and uh, herself had kind of involved in the creation of a uh, logo for the committee. And uh, initially, they brought some ideas that uh, they wanted to convey that, that the committee was basically uh, going to work as an access, uh, access or a, a hub or a nucleus for all the uh, involved in the solar um, community. And, and then it's a problem solving group that kind of connects all these various elements together. And if there was some way that we could kind of express that um, in a graphic uh, identity, um, that was kind of our goal. So initially, again, I just started kind of doing some some research on imagery, uh, solar, just trying to familiarize myself uh, with just some um, common visual elements that might that might convey themselves uh, and help communicate that idea. And taking into account the, the idea of a hub, um, an axis, or a nucleus, uh, I kind of started kind of gravitating towards, uh, for instance, the area in the center uh, where the cells, I don't know if that's the proper term, but uh, this kind of white diamond shape, uh, where those are connecting together, I, I felt like uh, in the current form of solar panels provided uh, a visual element. It was a hub and an axis already. So I kind of used that um, as a starting point to develop a, a, a mark that, that might be somewhat recognizable to the community already um, and help kind of convey that idea. Um, if we can advance. Uh, so from that original idea, we kind of just developed um, dozens of, of marks and ideas, these being just a few. Um, but again, we're kind of working with the idea of, uh, for instance, on the top version, uh, kind of overlapping of the different uh, people involved in the community, again, but with that central axis. Um, the, the one to the right was kind of dealing with the, the idea of uh, Energy going out, solar energy coming in, things like that. Other ideas that focus more on uh, solar or radiating of ideas, things like that. And the point was not necessarily to um, give a literal interpretation of anything, but more um, just to convey the idea in a, in a way that's not uh, going to end up being too um, dated soon, especially in the technology related. Um, field such as this where today's solar panel may not look at all like tomorrow's solar panel. Um, so anyway, through these and working with um, Hector and Paula about 
what, what they liked, what they didn't like, what was uh, being communicated well, what wasn't. We, if we could go to the next slide. Do you, sorry, Spock, yeah. do you want to say something? Oh, sure. yeah, I just had a question. Sure, do, you, sure. do you need the services of a graphic designer? Uh, or are you one? I am. Oh, you are one. Okay, okay. sorry, sorry. Uh, but, you know, all input is welcome for sure. Nope. Uh, just, just wanted to check. Yeah, if you yeah. needed one. No. Uh, so, this is the point that we're, that we're currently at where we still got the, um, the diamond element that references. Uh, References the solar panel that centered um, connecting point diamond. Uh, this kind of morphed into uh, kind of a radiating element that, um, as Paula felt like, was important to show um, the connectivity uh, in more of an active form um, because, because it is an action committee. And, you know, we didn't want to, uh, I think, what was important, I believe, to Hector and, and Expand on this was that it is a group that that is getting things done. We're not they're not um, just kind of passively talking about things, but they facilitate uh, moving, advancing the technology forward. Um, and then also the introduction of uh, the color spectrum and, and just to, as a way to uh, add a color element to it. Obviously, the kind of the solar on one side and, and almost uh, kind of ideas of energy flowing out on, on the right side. But um, you know, as that's kind of where we're at currently. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, any I guess feedback or oh, it looks good. I kind of turned it turned it that way, so it looks like the sun is oh, on the top, top and then it kind of oh. represents blue the atmosphere, and then possibly the earth you know, below the dark spot. Sure. Sure. I sure. I yeah. I think we did because we did it one time. Had it just as a traditional square, which seemed kind of static and, and not very. Uh, Dancing or anything, and I think the idea was the left to right came uh, as more of a thought of coming in and going out. Uh, but it's certainly worth, you know. I love it. I love both ideas. That looks great. Thank you. Cool. So that's a suggestion. Sure. The idea of the solar cell mm -hmm. um, is intriguing. Okay. So my thinking is if you can incorporate the image that you have into the letter. Uh, what part of that image is the actual... Uh, you know how you had uh, the solar cell with the diamond can incorporate to the lettering S E A C. So remember, look how big that is. Though when you start trying to yeah, put it on the to, document, it's it has gonna, to be proportional. Yeah. But it would kind of send a message. Yeah, that, that would be one thing uh, I think brought up in the point is that um, in work, and we did experience this specifically with. Um, I know a, a lot of the solar panels do have kind of a two horizontal band across them. Um, and initially we, we had this and tried to incorporate those bands too to be more of a literal um, illustration of a panel. And when you reduce that down, uh, you start losing details like that. And so there is a give and take as far as, right. um, but it's, you know, it's certainly, it's not certainly something that could be. Yeah, you have like four different options when you start it. You can take any of those four yeah. incorporate into the letter, kind of convey the message. Yeah, I think it, as long as it results in um, the abbreviation still being readable and understandable as the letters, you know, you don't want to fragment. I mean, his, his point is, is, is very good. I, I think for the general use of the logo, you know, simple is better, and, that, and that's great. If there's a special event, you could right. spruce it up for that yeah. special right. event. And, and I've discussed that, yeah, with Paula too, as far as like, for instance, you know, this is your general use. But if on your website you wanted to, whatever, make that look 3D or blah, blah, blah you can do those for, for special uh, instances. But you do want your your base version of your identity to, to be simple and reproducible across the wide range of um, because there will be instances where only a, a great scale um, use is possible. In that case, obviously the spectrum would reduce to a, a, a simple uh, gray to gray to black gradient. Uh, and then there will also be instances, I would imagine, at some point where you only have black and white available. And at that point, you would lose the gradient probably, and then the radiating arm would, would kind of uh, be the primary element. But it would still look 
because I, it's still a strong, uh, strong graphic that I think, and over time, as the committee uses it and it gets distributed across media, it will become um, the identity of, of the group. And so that's kind of what we were going for and kind of where we're at. Right All right. Now. Thank you so much. Yeah, you. Good job. Thanks so much, Dave. Thank Thank you. Sorry. Sure. I, was, I was thinking we should get a little more green. On the main side? And sure, yeah. Maybe it's a good idea. Like, down a few samples already, maybe draw more samples and then, you know, I don't know, float on them. Yeah, like. yeah kind of like, I mean, on the screen, yeah, you actually get more of a. Yeah, yeah. Then on the big screen, you kind of lose it a bit. So, a bit on the screen, you can actually see more. Yeah, and the color's not going to be 100% yeah. accurate. Yeah. Uh, so, we can certainly, as Dr. Sarah said, we can certainly adjust that. Yeah. Yeah, this, 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 is, this is pretty. This is really nice. Yeah, it's you know, for me anyway. I'd like to at least say that it's evocative of not only a cell but a module. The solar spectrum comes across, and I think it's quite elegant the way it is. Nicely done. I agree. I like the logo, and and I I'm not sure if somebody did suggest this, but if you rotated it at 90 degrees, you'd have the sun at the top where it normally is. But I understand the comment to the left to right too. So something to think about. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you, guys. All right, and then yeah, the, the um, one more comment. Uh, it's a real nice logo. I, I I think you mentioned that you might have to uh, change some of the tonal adjustments for a black and white version, which uh, would be nice uh, because a lot of documents are not printed in color. Right. Thank you. Thank you all. All right, and then we want to thank um, obviously IPD, um, uh, Arden, Stefan, Dak uh, for for working pretty hard on improving our go-to-webinar process and the audio and uh, the camera. Thank you guys. And um, they've also been working pretty late in the evening, um, returning emails, getting everything set up. Um, so thank you very much for your efforts. Um, then another update is, uh, I know at our last meeting we spoke about the workshop we were going to have in November. It was going to be on Friday the 13th and we've actually now uh, moved it. We're going to have it next year, February the 10th and the 11th. So it's going to be held over Wednesday and Thursday. Um, in your board packs you've actually got the save a date flyer because we didn't want any confusion so please make sure that um, you're aware that the workshop will be uh, next year over two days, and we'll have exhibitors. Uh, we're working on a lot of with a lot of the current members at the moment on um, programs, presentations, workshops. It's going to be a multifaceted um, day. So thanks, and Mustafa, thank you so much for your input on that too, and and Jeff, thank you. Just uh, the focus of the workshop should be on. On the achievements of TIAC, the work that's been done here, uh, all the solutions, and it's a great opportunity to present those to the public and to others in the industry so they, you know, they can benefit from everything, all, everything that, that you guys have been doing and been working on uh, now and sometime next year. Just one comment on the, the workshop is going to be open to the public and it's going to be advertised yes. for any yes. people on AHA. Like a mini SPI. <laughs> <laughs> That's still pretty big. It is. <laughs> and then um, I know Hector spoke a little bit earlier on um, SPI, and I'd like to thank, thank uh, Craig from Iron Ridge, uh, Mark of Enphase, um, Jeff of Quickmount for providing the passes for a lot of our SIAC members. It was great. We had a great turnout. Um, a lot of the AHJs that our members attended. And it was great to see them participate. I know I saw Pat there. Um, we saw Bezard, um, a lot of the County of LA. Pete Jackson, yeah. Yeah, Pete Jackson was there. So thank you so much for attending as well. And I, I know that a lot of the, the feedback we got was positive. I don't know if you want to mention something, Pat. Really? No, it was, it was, it was, to me it was the way more than I expected. Um, what I realized is that there's a lot of, a lot more major there's a product out there that I ever dreamed of. Um, we, we probably see, in, in the county, we probably see maybe 10 percent of the manufacturers that were at SBI. Um, that 10 percent apply for permits in our jurisdiction. So there's a whole other world of the industry out there that I wasn't even aware of. It's good, it's good to see it and be a part of it. Yeah, and we also 
we, um, I know Pat was uh, there as well. We attended the general session on the Wednesday morning. It was a bit of a wait time, probably about what was it, three to four hours. Yes. And um, we eventually got to hear um, Vice President Joe Biden give a, an address, and uh, that was pretty motivational. It gave me goosebumps. So, and he thanked all of us in the industry for doing an awesome job. So, it's great to give us a bit of a tap on the back, right? Um, and then we also at SPI walking around learned so much. Um, I mean, I walked out of there, and you know, we've got a, a list of growing issues, and that list just got longer. So, um, those issues are going to come up um, during our next meeting. So, and uh, thank you to Hector and myself and. Marcus as well, and Jeff, um, the panel discussion was great and so well attended. I mean, we had so many in that workshop. I, I think I counted over 50 people. And um, yesterday we had a press release as well that Jeff shared with all of us on Lean, uh, uh, Clean uh, Technica. Um, there it is on the screen right now. So, And um, it was great to, to see uh, Jeff and, and Hector and myself and um, Marcus up on the panel. So. That was great as well. Nice publicity and uh, good uh, top-notch message from you, Marcus. Thank you. You know, one other thing I'd like to mention, Meg. Uh, I, I knew it was the case. You know, the industry is so dynamic; it's just changing rapidly. But going to SBI, you really get a feel for how quickly it's changing, and the new products that are coming on board, and the, and the competition in, in the industry and everything. You really feel that when you walk through SBI. And it's a good thing. It's, it's dynamic and it's changing quickly. But that's going to be one of the challenges for us is, is keeping up with that industry. Yeah. yeah I mean, just want to the only first time I went to SPI yeah, was last year, and it was overwhelming. It's just it, it, so many new products, and and they all they want to come to California, they want to come to LA County, San Diego, and mm -hmm. and, and and it just is evolving it's so so fast. And then. And then, and then that lag between all this technology and the regulations and how do you deal with all these things and how you know how do you keep an open mind, you know, and say, hey, this is a good product, it's a bad product, to lift it or whatever. It, it's and, and making sure sticks ultimately. It, it's it's pretty amazing and it just it's it's rapid fire. <laughs> and it's being familiar with the products too, because when you're when you're unfamiliar with it, that's when it creates roadblocks and that's when it, that's when you're you say, Hey, wait a minute, you pause and that's but the industry doesn't want those costs. We don't want to be as busy. It's awareness and then knowing what's coming ahead of time and being prepared for it. Statement, last question. And, and you're bringing up something that the code recognizes. That the code is always behind the time. And that's why we have alternate methods and materials. Are, are, what you're seeing, do we need to start maybe exploring or Marketing that in the future here with the offset, we we have to start thinking about a way to use that part of the code to help this along. This is something for the groups to consider. The perfect example of what Spark is saying is uh, 2007, 2008, when Transformulus and Burgers hit North America. I can guarantee you that most of the average people out there in the field had no clue they're doing burger, and most AHAs didn't have a clue. As a matter of fact, most of them. And you really need to make sense of the chance to have alternate um, materials, not just materials, to be able to get around on that. If anybody was low on it at the time. <laughs> so, the way that I was approached, Sparky, at least up in the northern part of the state, um, the ICC tri chapters, which consist of the three big ones the East Bay, Monterey Bay, and Peninsula Chapter, um, they have a tri chapter uniform code committee. And what that purpose of that committee is to look uh, at, okay, we have the code says this, but we we're, we're, we have to experience. deal with we have to deal with the now, and how do we deal with the now? And so they're very careful though that they identify that these are uh, what they put together is draft policy. They have a draft policy of how they they had there was AB twenty one eighty eight was even thought about. They had one together for how they would deal with. Uh, doing uh, a quick uh, streamline uh, of PV. They have one for electric vehicles, have one for residential electric vehicles, and one for commercial electric vehicles. And they have, and they're all posted on their on their website. But they make clear that they are drafts that each jurisdiction 
then uses as a model because uh, just can you know what may work for LA County may not necessarily work for you or vice versa for example um, and because uh, you don't want to you don't want to undermine the the authority of uh, the code official has to at the end of the day the building official has to decide what is appropriate for their community like something that needs to move down this way but just suggesting you may want to uh, since there's already wording that's kind of put together for that type of function by groups such as the TUCC is uh, plagiarizing is usually what the sincerest form of flattery so you can you can simply maybe grab some of that wording and then just kind of change the names to protect the innocent or protect the guilty and then you can use that as as another means to say and, and I agree with what what Sparky's saying is, is that this is a forum to look at how do you address things that the code hasn't caught up with yet we got a question regarding that John um, you know we do similar things with ICC down in San Diego County but we typically when it comes to technical issues on electrical we don't rely too much on the building official as much as we do as our electrical committee as part of which ICC. is yeah, yeah, yeah. is that the same way they do it up there yeah the, uh, so so the the ICC tri chapters actually have a um, a working agreement with the IEI NorCal chapter in fact I will even be so bold as to say we're far better recognized by the IC the IAI NorCal chapter is far better recognized by ICC tri chapters than any other IAI chapter that I know of by any other ICC chapter that I know of. But yes, it's it, it, it's not a it's not a oh a couple of bill sorry a couple of billing officials sitting there and flipping a coin and saying, "Well, I, 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 I yeah, I know, I got electricals under me, and they just do whatever they." Well, John, that's how I ended up becoming part of this committee. Yeah, it's my frustration with that. <laughs> Very good. I'm just suggesting there's already a, a working model that's worked for many years up in the north, in uh, the Bay Area. That uh, again, just simply grab some of their words, their, the way they structure it and the way they present it, and and then, uh, I, like I said, the chair's form of flattery. Thank you, John. Thank you. And then also to mention. Um, oh, and, and by the way, if you want to see it, the ICCEastBay.org is where all the TUCC stuff is, is housed. And what's that committee called again? That TUCC, Tri Chapter Uniform Code Committee. And they meet monthly. Stop it. All right, so um, we, we, we're still evaluating and looking at online solar permitting software. And at SPI last week, uh, we actually met with a company called uh, PB Permit Design. Um, and uh, they're advancing pretty rapidly on automating the guidebook toolkit. So I would probably imagine that in the next month or two, we, we could look at inviting them to come and present everybody. So that's pretty exciting. Um, we've had a look at the SIAC logo. We also want to mention um, the SIAC message uh, that we sent everyone. We did discuss it at our meeting last week, so there's a couple of options. We can still modify it, and um, we probably, we'd like to aim at hopefully by next next meeting to have, um, you know, to peg it and, and kind of say this is our message, so that when it comes to marketing and broadcasting our message. We have something that everybody is uh, familiar with and consistent. So any feedback, please provide that to me in the next month between now and our next meeting so we can we can all agree on the SIAC message. Uh, the draft operator guidelines, um, I've sent that to all of you as well and shared that. I, I think that it's pretty pretty standard. I don't think that there's anything critical or worrisome in it. So if we could also do the same and if all of you could uh, could read through that and let me know your feedback and comments as well. Um, then also the updates on the group assignment issues in 528, which is UL 2703. I know that September has been a crazy off the hook uh, month. Okay, I've grabbed that quote from you on that, but anyway. Um, and we're going to be extending the deadline on those issues. So September, yeah, there were a lot of members who had activities and events, understandably, so there wasn't enough time commitment to address the UL 2703. And we also thought that with this month's meeting, 
a good idea to have John and Sunny uh, present so that all the groups have a really good understanding and overview on it so the next month we can really move ahead uh, more progressively on that. Um, so you didn't say the deadline, you just said it was extended. So yeah, we, we'll discuss the deadline when we get to agenda item number nine. Okay. Yeah. Where are we on the first items that we're addressing as far as the one what are the items? And then we also have a positive status update on engaging with the LADWP. So Frank, um, thank you. And uh, Hector, would you like to share? Sure. Uh, the Chiaro, I'll see you all, uh, She offered to um, contact the mayor's office and then uh, by, you know, by chance and just, you know, people in, in that we network with Sabrina Bornstein, who used to be with the CSE. She now works for the mayor's office, and she contacted me and um, we chatted for a while. And she gave us a couple good names uh, at the mayor's office, uh, and so we're going to work work with them um, and see if we can get water and power aboard. And she suggested Michael Webster, who's the director of Power Systems Engineering and Technical Services. Jason Rondu, solar programs manager. And Sabrina also asked, um, it just, you know, she wants to know what, how we're progressing at CX. And we could send her, you know, the last few meetings, the agenda, the meeting summary, so she can kind of catch up, see what's going on, and and I'll help help that office get more familiar with our efforts. So it's not a huge leap, but it, it is progress. It is progress. <laughs> well, I think too, from I could, I could jump in yeah. because it's actually we're working on a customer now, LA. Got sold in July, and I think we get the market teams involved. Actually, got an answer. So the answer is we'll get it to you in four to six weeks. Wow. I just don't get that. I just, I just, if we're trying to get solar installed. Why does it take four to six weeks? I mean, and Chris is one of our understand the process. But coming from a consumer background and home improvement, I just, this is crazy. Now. I mean, you got that solar installed and it's just sitting there. But what are they going to come out and do in four to six weeks? That, than expect by the HJ, right? So what is it going to do? I mean, I, I just don't get it. <laughs> you know, the unfortunate thing with that is that when you talk to, when you go to these conferences, you talk to people, they approach you, they talk about LA. And LA to them is everything and everything in LA County. So, you know, I'm representing LA County, so you, it's you guys. And we get put in the same bucket, you know, and so the image that LA County gets, it's, it's you know, whether it's water or power or anybody else, we all get painted the same way. So reaching out to water or power and getting them here is very important so we can hopefully address that critical issue. I appreciate it. I was just going to say, you know, I got Tiffany sitting here next to me and I don't, yes. I don't think they're the same boat as water and power, right. but SED also, there's a lot of delays on their side too, and I don't know if maybe Tiffany can kind of give a little explanation of why that is and why the new police gets kind of a bad rep for so long. How about this? Can we call them you know, that when one of another item is further on? Is that time? Okay. okay. Yeah. All right, good. So we're going to talk about utilities later then? Well, in general. So I'll, I'll, you'll see where I'm getting at. Because because the what I was going to say is that I think that there's part we need to understand there is some differences between a municipal utility right. and a privately owned utility, first of all. And, uh, and I was just, re you know, remember the, the, the question and conversation that came up from the guy from Anaheim Power, City, city of Anaheim Power, during uh, the SEAC, uh, excuse me, the SEAC presentation that was on Thursday. And remember the specific questions he had about, about how did AB 2188 affect utilities and and so I think that that it would be something of a, a good conversation but I think we also need to be aware that uh, there is another organization USERC e -U -S -E -R -C, that already has for the last year and a half at least two years has a committee that is specifically addressing PV and PV connections and the, the difficulty has always been with, with the, there's 80 some odd utilities that are members of USERC. USERC 
covers 12 Western United States. And the, the difficulties that USERC has is that each utility has a different infrastructure. And therefore, they will try to come up with a model that will work across the board. But then when they come up with all of their designs that they establish, then they have a matrix of, OK, this, uh, these particular designs are only accepted by these particular utilities. And the, and the whole reason, as I understand it, is basically, uh, bottom line, it has to do with the infrastructure that was established long ago by each utility. Because not all utilities are the same. But I think that we that it, again, it's one of those things where we there's another avenue, another area that we can be not trying to reinvent the wheel, but trying to see okay, what is another group doing, and then uh, that actually has those stakeholders because uh, there's at least 30 plus utilities that show up uh, to those meetings. So. Um I actually uh, cannot attend next, next before the issues of capital. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about some of this. Maybe potentially that there may be some some of the things that we need to discuss in the, the next couple months. All right, and then lastly, on our status update, we actually do have a tour with SDG and E tomorrow. So thank you. So we're going to hang out with you again tomorrow. Uh, we're looking really forward to learning more about your operations and challenges. So thank you for arranging that. And then if we could move on to um, agenda item number five, which is the draft meeting summary of August the 27th. Um, I don't know if there's any comments, modifications that need to and if, and if there is a motion to approve. from somebody shuffling papers by one of the microphones, so just want to make that mention. Thank you. Uh, and thanks for having me to come on to present to you. Um, give a quick overview of uh, NABCEP and uh, then discuss some of the new uh, activities that we are working on that I think will be of, of interest to this committee. Um, just quick background, uh, for those of you who don't know, NABSTEP, we're the North American Board of Certified Energy Practitioners. Uh, we were formed as a nonprofit organization in 2002, uh, de delivered our first certification exams for uh, solar installation professionals in 2003. Uh, since, since then, we have uh, certified uh, over uh, 3,800 professionals in the solar industry. Uh, most of those, what we're most well known for is our solar installation professional certification. Uh, but we, we do also have a uh, technical sales, uh, PV technical sales certification, and a solar heating installer certification. Um, the, we do have uh, entry level programs for people looking to get into the industry. The professional level certifications are intended for those 
who do have uh, fairly substantial experience and education in the industry doing those jobs. So we have entry level programs in, in photovoltaics and solar heating as well for uh, people looking to get into the industry and uh, learn the fundamentals of those, uh, those technologies. Uh, a newer program uh, that NABCEP runs is a uh, company accreditation program. We have a, a few companies out in California that have achieved that accreditation. Um, we're looking to grow that program uh, within the next year or so. We've got a, a number of applications right now that we're, we're looking at. That's a process where we look at the, the entire um, uh, company, their operations, uh, their safety records, their personnel qualifications, uh, and, and all of that in, in, a, in a broader process. All of the certification programs that we've run uh, and that we've run since 2003, those are targeted at the individual person uh, as any certification program is. Um, our installation professional and solar heating installer certifications are accredited by uh, ANSI to uh, the ISO 17024 standard, which is the international standard for how do you run a personnel certification program. Uh, so we have been accredited to that uh, standard for running certifications uh, since 2007 uh, for those programs. So, you know, we're, we're well established within the solar industry. Um, uh, there are a handful of uh, jurisdictions across, the, mainly it's um, incentive programs uh, where we see a requirement being set for uh, for our certifications, um, but we are intended as voluntary certification for people working in the business, a way to differentiate themselves from others in the industry. Uh, NABCEP um, is formed, uh, like I said, we have a board of directors that, that runs the organization. They all represent various sectors of uh, the solar industry or renewable energy industry in general, I should say. Uh, collectively, our board has well over 300 years of experience. I think the average amount of experience is, is right around 20 years of, uh, of experience of, our, of, of everyone on our board. Uh, we have over 100 volunteers uh, from the industry that serve on our technical committees that help develop um, the examinations, uh, keep those current, uh, that help d develop the job task analysis on which a uh, certification program is built. Is built. Uh, and help keep those current on a, on a regular basis as well. Um, primarily, voluntary certifications are geared towards uh, the primary purpose of really any certification is, is for consumer protection. Uh, it's a level for the, you know, it's a way for the consumer to identify someone who has been um, evaluated and tested uh, to, to do that job uh, by a third party organization uh, such as ourselves. So, uh, we can, you know, we can tell the consumer that, you know, this person has passed our you know, fairly rigorous examinations on how do you do the job of installing PV systems or selling PV systems or installing solar heating systems. And uh, as such, uh, like I said, some incentive programs, be they uh, state incentive programs or utility incentive programs, there are a handful of those across the state that have, or across the U.S. that have uh, adopted step certification as a quality assurance mechanism um, as they're investing in these systems with uh, rebate money uh, or other incentive funds. Uh, they, they use NABCEP certification as a way to uh, make sure that the work that they are uh, buying a piece of, so to speak, uh, is, is being done by, by a qualified person that's been, been tested on their solar specific uh, knowledge and experience. Um, the one one piece uh, that that we really wanted to talk to this group about is uh, that we've been funded by uh, New York State uh, NYSERDA, the New York State Energy Research Development Authority, to develop uh, certi uh, basically certification program, a credential program for uh, inspectors. Uh, with regard to, we've developed two programs. One is oriented at people who are inspecting EV systems, and one is oriented uh, people who are inspecting solar heating systems. Um, we are in that process right now. We have uh, formed our technical committees and they've developed the draft job task analysis for the, each of those areas. Uh, that job task analysis has uh, gone through a public comment period and um, 
is uh, be being submitted to the board for final approval in the next couple of weeks. Uh, so we expect that that final job task analysis will be uh, out on the street in another month or so. Uh, from that, we are uh, starting to develop the examination uh, to test one's um, you know, competence in, in inspecting PV systems and inspecting solar heating systems. Um, the, so we have a technical committee again formed to uh, create those examinations. Um, and they are starting to meet in, uh, in the next couple of weeks to, to begin working on that exam. Uh, the, primary, you know, the primary audience for, this, uh, for these credentials will be obviously people who are performing that work, who are doing inspections of these systems. Uh, it's certainly not intended as a um, you know, replacement uh, for uh, the broader uh, certification programs, the professional certifications uh, that are run by IAEI, ICC, uh, it's, it's intended to sort of enhance that and for those who are working as in the inspection community, um, code officials, other people either working for, you know, municipalities uh, or uh, potentially also for third parties that are inspecting on behalf of um, utilities uh, that are doing inspections there uh, or incentive programs uh, that are doing inspections. Uh, make sure they know the, you know, the, the really big important things to look at when you're looking at these systems. Uh, it's, you know, so it's specialized uh, in those areas. What are the things when you're looking at a PV system or solar heating system uh, that the inspector needs to be aware of? Uh, part of the job task analysis um, process is to identify the criticality of, of each task. Uh, and then the examination becomes based on on that, uh, how frequently a task is done and how critical it is to do that task correctly uh, with regard to, you know, again, what are you looking at with these, with these systems? So uh, we, the, the, uh, the, the full credential will be launched uh, early next year. Um, we'll certainly keep uh, the committee updated on the, on the status of that. Um, again, we intend it to be a, a voluntary certification for those uh, working in the industry inspecting systems uh, to be able to receive a, a recognition from NAPSEP uh, that they, you know, that they have qualifications and that they have been tested on their, their ability to inspect uh, PV systems and solar heating systems. Uh, so that's, the, that's a quick overview for everybody. I appreciate the opportunity to, to give you that update and we'll, we'll definitely keep you um, updated as things progress and uh, happy to answer any, uh, any questions anyone has. Questions for Richard? Yeah. yeah, I have a question. This is Don. I have a question for Richard. What's the what's the cost of the certification, and what's the CEU uh, continuing education unit process for that certification? That's great. I, I don't have the the specific answers for those. Um, uh, the, the committee has not decided, and the board has not approved those uh, those items yet. So unfortunately, I don't have that answer for you. Um, for the installer, do you have that? I can, yeah, I can tell you for the installer uh, credentials, uh, certifications, it's a three-year renewal process. Uh, so every three years, uh, they do have to maintain the certification. Uh, the requirement is they do have to demonstrate experience uh, installing a, a minimum of three systems during that time. Uh, so they do, it's an experience uh, requirement. Um, and then the education requirement is 18 uh, continuing education hours during that three-year period. Um, we do specify for the PV installer, uh, six of those hours do need to be on electric code, um, and the other six uh, have to be specific on PV, you know, design and installation. Uh, some of the other ones can be a, a little bit more related. Um, usually everybody gets it in PV or code uh, classes. Uh, the, the renewal fee is, um, for the professional certifications, it's $395 every three years. Uh, the inspector credentials will be will be less than that. I can I can guarantee that. Okay, I'm sorry. So, Richard, is this program for inspectors are done on a, for a single family, or is it done abroad for industrial, commercial as well? It, it is primarily focused on a residential and a small commercial. Uh, that tends to be where our, 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 you know, our market is. It's, not, it's certainly not going to get up into the utility, 
utility scale systems. Um, but the you know the job as defined is is a uh, residential commercial. We don't uh, typically don't have a, an actual system size sort of limit uh, with regard to that. But um, you know generally I'd say it's a few hundred kilowatts. Uh, once you start getting above that, um, it's a bit you know you're getting into that uh, larger. And your tra training facilities, are they local? I mean, do we have to travel to 12 states or we can have it locally done in where we actually are? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, NABSEP actually doesn't do the training. Uh, we just do the testing part. Uh, so the, um, the training would be delivered, uh, you know, locally by a number of providers. Um, for the inspector credentials, uh, right now we're not looking at requiring training to qualify for that. Um, we expect that those, you know, that training courses will certainly be helpful for anyone preparing for that exam, um, uh, depending on the, the rest of the uh, So we, we do hope, you know, really the ultimate goal of these programs is to increase the knowledge of, uh, of people doing inspections across the country. Um, we've you know, identified that as a need, and, and particularly, like I said, starting here in New York, um, uh, NYSERDA identified that, you know, they really want to make sure the inspectors here, uh, their knowledge is increasing, and, uh, but our, you know, our process of doing that is to offer that certification exam uh, to test somebody on the knowledge, uh, and then uh, there's, there's a plethora of training programs out there, and our, you know, the job task analysis that we develop really serves as the blueprint for training somebody uh, in that job. Question? Oh, sorry, Pat. And yeah, the question I have is, are, will the certification focus mainly or strictly on uh, NEC requirements, or will it include structural aspects, uh, possibly even area, you know, the jurisdictional area requirements, like California may have some requirements that are a little bit different than the rest of the country, or will it you know, what, what is, the, what is the, the actual focus of the certification? Uh, the PV one will be primarily uh, electrical. However, there is structural components that are included in the, um, in the job task analysis, so inspecting those. Uh, the, it, it isn't, it's going to be a nationally administered exam. Um, so, uh, you know, when looking, it's not going to be able to test on uh, local jurisdictional requirements. Richard, uh, just Jeff Spees, uh, would it, from a structural perspective, address the, uh, the California Solar Permitting Guidebook uh, requirements, and uh, also would it address in any fashion the mechanical load requirements in UL 2703? Uh, those are good questions. The, uh, you know, the job task analysis tends to be more generic in terms of uh, saying that they need to inspect the components, whatever those are, mechanical, electrical components, uh, in compliance with the, uh, you know, the standards, the codes that are in place uh, in the jurisdiction. The, we're, we're in the phase right now where we're, we're putting together the examination committee and uh, starting to write the examination questions. In that process, uh, they will identify the primary resources that are referenced for each of the questions. Uh, that list of primary references uh, will be published uh, when the you know when the program is really launched. So, uh, certainly looking for feedback from you all on which of those standards um, we should be using and referencing. Well, under the circumstances, I'd like to volunteer for some work with that committee if that would be helpful to address both the, the permitting guidebook as well as UL 2703. Great. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, quick question, Richard. Um, this is Fazad with LA City. Just quick, that the examination that you have, does it address all PV type systems or is it restricted to certain types of PV systems? Uh, we don't have the examination yet, but we work, we're working on it right now. Uh, it is, it, it covers roofs, yeah, it covers, uh, I, I would say, most PV systems. I mean, sir, uh, the, the, it, the, the intent is that it's going to address the majority of systems being installed. So ground mounts, roof mounts, um, different roofing types, 
uh, that it'll be installed on. But yeah, microinverter-based systems, central string inverter-based systems uh, would all be covered there. Including battery-based and so forth? Yes, there is a section on inspecting uh, storage components in the electrical, uh, in the PV1. Okay. Thank you. Chris? Hey, Richard, this is Chris from Varanga. Uh, do you have any more information on who the best contact person would be for the company-wide certification as well as any pricing you might already have? Yeah, there's you know there's information on our website uh, napsup.org uh, on the, the sidebar you'll see a, a bulletin for company accreditation. Uh, our staff person who runs that is Catherine Casey, uh, Catherine with a K, uh, and it can uh, K A Casey K C A S E Y at napsup.org. Hey Richard, this is Don Hughes. I have a question for you. Are you guys working with the IA at all to identify the the educational needs for this? Because as a, just a certification body, the, you're going to have a lot of people that are that are falling short on the math for the temperature coefficient adjustments for 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 all of the basic elements that are contained within the NEC codebook. And the IAI seems to be the the primary educational resource. Have you guys made contact or are working with IAI as the training provider for the for the world of electrical inspectors? Since you're just doing certification, that way you guys can at least identify where the where the training needs are, what what regions, what areas, and what technical abilities that that are lacking most, and then maybe directing your your failing applicants to the IAI for educational programs. Uh, that's a great question. We did reach out to IAEI initially uh, in the to work with them on creating the program. Um, with regard to the training, we really do need to, well, the, the, the ANSI standard uh, requires a clear separation between training providers and certification testing providers. So um, the, uh, it, it gets a little uh, challenging to sort of recommend specific training providers uh, or to, um, to offer training. It, for NAPSEP to actually offer training to prepare someone for the exam. Um, because the standard on how do you run a certification program is really based on just the testing side of things. Uh, and we, we try to stay within that standard. So uh, we, you know, what we will be doing is publishing the job task analysis that says this is, you know, this is what we're testing on. And we will be doing the test. Uh, we certainly and, and hope that people then see that and say, I need to get some training and, you know, would go to their local, um, you know, training providers, uh, IAEI and, and uh, ICC uh, and others that are doing that. Yeah, kind of building upon what uh, Don mentioned there, have you, have you discussed any kind of partnerships with ICC, specifically jurisdiction? They recognize ICC as one of the biggest, uh, you know, certification organizations, and it might be a benefit there because, you know, they already already got their foot in the door and they recognize all building officials are familiar with ICC. And I'm not trying to, you know, it, it just seems like it, it it'd be a good thing to consider, um, possibly a partnership with IAEI and ICC. Yeah, and we've had uh, some discussions with ICC as well. Um, and you know, my my understanding from from both organizations really is that uh, they offer the comprehensive uh, certification exams for uh, code officials in or inspectors, um, and that uh, again, I can't put put words in either of their mouths, but m my understanding is that neither of them really want to develop specialty credentials uh, like we are for solar uh, because there's so many uh, different types of technologies and systems and um, that that someone needs to inspect uh, you know we recognize that this is a um, you know this is a limited skill set that we're looking or a limited um, area of practice um, uh, I, I, I don't like the term micro credential uh, but that's uh, the sort of the the framework with, with which we're working on is we're not looking to really compete with again the the broader certification, but do want to have a 
a voluntary process where someone can get recognized. One of the things we are looking at uh, maybe trying to work with uh, ICC and I, I, IAEI on is uh, perhaps the, you know, passing that exam can count towards some of the continuing educa education credits that someone might need um, to, to maintain their, their overall certifications with those programs. Yeah, Richard, uh, Craig here with uh, Iron Ridge. Just have one question. You know, I wasn't quite clear if I heard you correctly. You said there are, there are a couple of jurisdictions uh, in the nation that require NABSEP certification for installers. Could you, uh, did I hear that correctly? Uh, it's not the jurisdiction. It's actually the, the typically it's a incentive program like NYSERDA uh, does require NABSEP PV installation professional. Uh, or um, uh, being an IBEW uh, trained uh, PV electrician. Uh, those are sort of the two options to get access to the incentive, the rebate programs in New York State. Uh, various states have different um, sort of qualifications to quali get access to those rebates. Um, state of Colorado does get a bit more into um, authority to do the work, it's more of a license. Uh, state of Utah were an option to get to get into the license program. Uh, the same in um, Rhode Island uh, recently put that in place. Uh, Tennessee Valley Authority uh, throughout their entire jurisdiction, eight, seven, eight states in the south, uh, they require at least our entry level um, credential uh, to to get access to their incentive programs from the Tennessee Valley Authority. So there's there's a variety of ways that um, that uh, jurisdictions have heard a couple of towns that do require us. Uh, it, they are very few and far between. Uh, NAPDEP does not promote or really actively encourage any you know adoption of our uh, certification as a license. Uh, it's not developed as a license. It's not intended to be a license. Uh, it is intended as a voluntary certification for someone to be able to distinguish themselves. Uh, that said, somebody that's running an incentive program or running a um, uh, that are financing systems, uh, we do see a, a good use for that certification there uh, to make sure that they're spending their money um, on someone that is that has been tested. Thank you for the enforcing, or somebody that's enforcing 690.4 E or 690.4 C in the uh, or D in the 2014 code. Sorry, John. All right. Uh, two questions. First is, is that uh, when you're talking about on the installer side, uh, have there have you done the same thing you were trying to do with uh, on the certification talking with ICC and IAI? Have you gone and talked to IBEW and NECA at all? And, and partnering up with on them their side since they have uh, various certifications for the installers already, and as, and also considering that NECA has a installation um, standard for PV, I don't know if, I, if the rest of you are aware of that, but there's an ANSI PV standard, ANSI PV installation standard that is produced and published by NECA. So I'm just curious if you've had any uh, discussions with NECA or IBW about partnering up. Sure, I'd say uh, when NAPSEP was originally formed, uh, our board of directors had uh, specific positions carved out for uh, various representations from, from different sectors of the industry, and there was uh, specifically a, a position for the, uh, both of those organizations, and we did have representation uh, from both those organizations as those programs were developed, uh, again, starting in uh, 2002. Um, so we did have, uh, we did have participation by those organizations in developing those programs. Uh, we, are, they, you know, are they continuing to be involved or? Uh, they're no longer on our board. They, uh, no. I got a comment on John on what John mentioned. My experience uh, we, with my experience with the solar industry is yes, you do have the you know you'd have NEC involved to a certain degree, the IBEW, but generally speaking, the people that I see doing solar installations are, are not from an electrical background, so to speak. It's more of 
apartment industry that kind of grew on itself with people that were not previously electricians or electrical contractors. I just want to make a last uh, statement as far as my questions. And if you guys could get IEI, especially IEI, to certify your program, it would be very easier for us as a jurisdiction to implement because we are our electrical inspectors. And if the, the program or certification is certified by IAEI, we feel much better than the trained in our inspectors toward that program. Sure. Um, you know, our PV installation professional is accredited to an ISO standard uh, on how do you run certification programs. Uh, we're developing uh, these new credentials fully in accordance with that international standard as well for how do you certify someone to do a job. Um, I, I, I certainly, un, you know, we recognize the position of IAEI and ICC in certifying uh, inspectors, uh, you know, electrical inspectors uh, for that overall job of inspecting electrical systems. Uh, and we have uh, the PV specific experience and are testing on those PV specific applications uh, that we think is, is you know, very valuable to uh, people, particularly in jurisdictions where there's a, you know, a, a lot of uh, solar installation work going on. You know, that is our experience. Uh, we are, uh, our board of directors, all of our volunteers are all from the solar industry and that's our, you know, that's our niche uh, that we bring to, that we're, we're looking to bring to the inspection community. So, so there, uh, with that then, are there any are there any uh, inspectors that are on your board, or are they all installers? Uh, currently, we don't have an inspector on the board. Uh, there, there are inspectors that are on the technical committees that are developing, uh, that have developed the program, and uh, that are writing the examinations. Yes. And then, and then my other, my my, my previous, but I didn't get my second question in, was, uh, uh, have you also had any? Uh, uh, reaching out and having any conversations with NRCA, with the National Roofing Contractors Association. Uh, we're, we regularly, yeah, communicate with um, RISE, their their sort of certification arm, uh, where the NRCA uh, is a partner in that uh, roof integrated solar energy uh, certification. And yes, we do uh, contact with them regularly. Chris, last question. Do you see uh, do you see the inspectors kind of testing and track being significantly different from the PV certified installation pro track? Because essentially, if we're installing it one way, shouldn't we be teaching the inspectors the exact same thing and vice versa? I mean, we shouldn't be installing it one way to be inspected a different way. So aren't we kind of just duplicating our efforts there in a way? Well, the, the, the answer to that is it's your drawing. Your, oh, for your sure. package of metals, for sure. and then we, we will review that. Yeah, but I mean, we shouldn't be building it one way for you guys to inspect it a different way. We're, we're, okay. doing, we're doing it the same way. So I'm, Hopefully I'm, you're all using yeah. the NEC and the right. IBC and yeah. the Actually, yeah. yeah. There will be some commonality, <laughs> sure. but there's certain areas that are not going to be the same yeah, as the different colors. But, there are, there will be mean, some we're, we're, we're areas that are cut. qualifying jobs the same way you guys should be inspecting jobs as far as structure, existing issues, electrical and otherwise. I mean, I, I'm only saying that as far as where we're coming from is, is we're trying to do the same due diligence that we think the inspector is going to ultimately do to grade us on our final product because we're building everything for both jurisdictional approval and long life. So, I mean, I, I kind of think we're almost doing the same thing here in a way. Not Before we go to far uh, that actually that was part of the discussion that happened in 188 the single inspection, and that if you have a checklist for the inspector, you have a checklist for installer, there should be definitely some commonality there. So things match as much as possible. And I have more of a, a, a statement versus a question. I talked to you about this last week, Jim. Yeah. Well, I'll talk to Sunrun about it. And if we're going to come up with training for combination inspectors, what we really need is some things identified by the industry. What, what are the problems you're seeing with the inspectors? What, 
what in your mind is a misapplication? Where are they missing the mark? We've already surveyed the inspection community. We think we, we understand what they're seeing and what they consider a violation. Now we need that list from you. And that's the only way effective training is going to sure. come out, and that's the only way you're going to get consistency. Sure. So let's go back to Richard. Uh, Richard, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, the re reason we brought Richard on board at the last meeting, I don't know if it's Jeff or somebody else mentioned that, there are some certification programs for installers. And, and Richard, you, you mentioned um, consumer protection. And, and is this something down the line, uh, NAFSAID or other organizations that SEAC, I'm going to use the word recognize or, or maybe endorse, I don't know. Uh, so, or, or maybe your organizations market that to, to folks out there and say, hey, uh, for, for the homeowners, property owners, uh, this is a way to make sure that the person showing up on your site is a qualified, is a qualified person. So we're putting that on the table, maybe for future discussion. Uh, as will send along down the line to something that the wants to do. John, last one. Well, I, I'd say that you know, NAPSEP is certainly an organization that does this. I think there are other organizations right. as well. And I think it would behoove us to identify what are all, who are all of them right. and and then to you know, to look at that rather than necessarily just say, Oh, okay, we're we're done with this subject. Exactly. That's a, that's a very good point. There are other folks out there. So it may be, you know, up to the committee. Both, yeah, both from an inspector uh, uh, qualification as well as an installer qualification. And I think to don't forget the code calls for person who installed the installer has to be qualified. Right. Well, and the, the NAPSEP is definitely one of the companies that are actually qualifying the, the installer. So certainly a, a method, but there are yes, others. There are of course. Others. Of course. Richard, thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it. And um, good rest of the day. Great, thank you. Okay, going on to item number seven. I'm going to stand up for that. Bring it up to me. What's about you, Pat? Where are we on the first four issues? Yeah. Okay. For, for you to stop to try to make it online because the answer is other Okay, okay. Thank you. I just have a request yes. <laughs> <laughs> to move this item to the agenda. Uh, Kyle and Pat need to leave early, so they, they want to hear about UO 2703. So we'll skip, if you guys don't mind, item 7 for now. And we'll, uh, so if we can go straight into... You really need to hear this because they already say the battle shit, between know it. Between Richard, uh, you should know, know it. What's the problem? You want to see the battle between you all and ETL, and, and we just do not have it. The battle. The, 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 the battle is. This is not a battle. Uh, this, this is about a discussion about a standard. This is not a discuss, uh, a battle about how one certifies this or that. So with those we're words, we're going to have Sunny. <laughs> Am I correct, Sunny? Yeah, that's, hey, that's what we talk, that's what we talked about last week. Yeah, we so I want to start it. <laughs> I, I want to commend these guys. We were at SPI and they were talking to each other, uh, <laughs> friends, and only to coordinate. Uh, let's make sure we don't get too far. All right. Uh, uh, good friend. Yes. Sir. <laughs> <laughs> so who's going to go first? I'll go first. John. And 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 I I have a rogue a rogue PowerPoint. If that's going to work for you. Do you have? Do they have it? No. I just I was still monkeying with it. Okay. Five minutes ago. Okay. Marcus is laughing because he heard the, the, the rumors. The rumors are true. John Thacker does, does do changes to his presentation. But what the question is, is that how can I do this? I can just go from it and or I can plug in. Which one of these, which way you want to go? I don't have a USB. Oh, I, I don't have a, 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 a... Just plug in? Just plug in. Yeah. Where's your... Uh, but then that's going to change everything on the screen. Oh yeah, yeah. So never mind. I'll I'll send this to you so you have it. But but a couple of things that um, for those of you who see my screen, a couple of things that I wanted to hit on. Um, uh, first of all, is uh, in regards to uh, I think 
Let's take a higher level viewpoint for starters. What is the purpose of standards? Why do we have standards? We have standards so that uh, that we can have a harmony with the installation code. We have practical and sufficient. You don't have to take notes on this because you'll get the full thing. Uh, we have practical and sufficient requirements to address certain identified risks. We want to have repeatable test results. We want to have input from all the stakeholders, not just the manufacturers, not just the test labs, not just the HJs, but all the stakeholders. And that it's going to be used as the basis for product certification. And when I'm talking about the repeatable test results, I'm not just talking about the repeatable test results between test labs like between, say, UL and ETL, but I'm also talking about having repeatable test results that are from engineer to engineer within our own organizations or within our different facilities. So okay, that sir, is all. Quick question. Is, can yeah. we see the presentation that's being shown to folks here remotely? It's not being shown to anybody except me, me, myself, and I. Or if you want, I could take a few moments and just put this, if I have a USB. I got a USB. Yeah, USB. yeah, it would be very helpful if we could see that. I appreciate it. I'm good with that. So I think, yeah. take, take five minutes. Take five minutes. Want to get coffee, go to the restroom. I want to go. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Oh, come on, Jeff. It'll be more exciting this way. No, no, no. It's not on there. Stan, while we're on a break, uh, Arden, I'm not sure if you can hear, but... Uh, oh. I'm sorry, what was that? Arden, can you hear? Okay, uh, I'm not sure if you can. I think you, you said you can hear me, Paul, but uh, the question box... I don't think we can probably hear it. Oh, sorry. Just ask it through the chat, Jeff. That's you can't. That's the problem. The chat doesn't work. You well, can't we have ask. to the chat again. <laughs> you, you can't. <laughs> I, can, I, I can hear you on the phone. Is, but that was pretty funny. Yeah. Yeah. I can hear you on the phone if it's any consolation, oh, right. Jeff. <laughs> okay. uh, I just don't think they can hear you in the room. Yeah, I, I, I do think that the people who are on the GoTo webinar are having the same problem where we can't ask questions through the chat box. I wonder if the So if anybody who is on the GoTo webinar can use the chat box, that would be really helpful to know uh, if that works for anybody or if it's not working for everybody. That's helpful. No. I'll try it right now, Jeff. Jeff, I just threw a note in there to the group. That's interesting because it's not working for me. I'll try logging off and logging back on. Maybe that'll solve the problem. I've done that once, but I'll give it a shot. Yeah, here I am. Okay. I'm looking at your question. I'm not sure. Yeah. And that was the purpose of the presentation. Yeah. And I'm, you know, I'm
but uh, there are uh, a, a, a great uh, uh, balance. There's, a, there's definitely a balance that's maintained. You know that nobody can be over 33 percent. You will always find on an FTT, by the way, that the producers will tag out uh, on that, and then that's because obviously they're concerned about what's going to be in the stand that's going to affect them. Um, so that gives you a breakdown. Again, it's a balanced committee. And only one, each organization gets one vote. So UL, Chris Lukager on there has one vote. Sonny has one vote. Guys from TV Ryland has one vote. Uh, Pete Jackson has one vote, uh, so forth and so on. And then the stop the several others that, that are on the committee. Go to the next one, please. Okay, so it's the standard for safety for mounting systems, mounting devices, clamping retention and devices, and ground legs for use with uh, flat plate, photovoltaic modules and panels. Big mouthful of a, of a title for a standard. Uh, uh, so that's the title. Go to the next slide, please. A couple things I think we need to keep bear in mind. Originally, this started out as an outline investigation. We'll get into talk about outlines of investigation later, but bottom line is, is that uh, when we when we get to some of the additional challenges we have as a CX, but outlines of investigation are developed when there is no other standard out there that clearly addresses a product. We uh, UL engineers write the, uh, write these outlines and we post them. We take, uh, we publish them available for everyone and anyone to see and to use. Um, and it's, it, because why do we do that? Because it takes a long time for a standard to be developed. Because again, we have all those competing interest groups all debating on what needs to be in the standard. The first edition of this of UL 2703 is January 28, 2015. So it's just this year. Now, on one hand, you can say, well, gee, John, it was based. Uh, it even says in the standard, it says new requirements were substantially in accordance with the proposal dated September 26, 2014, which in essence was pretty much the outline of investigation John, from before. Did you say outline investigations are readily available and about? I didn't say that for okay. even standard. That's what I wanted to hear. I didn't even say that for standard. <laughs> no, because of the cost. Of, uh, it's no different than, let's see, are the ICC codes or the NSPA codes available readily for, uh, uh, it costs, you know, you have to pay for, for various documents. Um, there is, uh, there, there's all sorts of lawsuits flying around on that kind of thing. I don't even want to get into that. But the bottom line is, is that um, these, these new requirements are substantially based on that. And what you'll also see in the introduction of the standard, it says, the future effective date of all the new requirements in the standard is July 28, 2016. The standard technical panel decides on what, when those effective dates are. The reason I bring this up is because some of you are probably going, well, when does this apply, John? Uh, I can have a place right now. You've got to give manufacturers time. Once they see the published, they have to have time to react to it. No different than you don't just, uh, the NEC comes out, and then the next day we start, uh, the next edition, we start applying it. We, there is a there's a window of time to give everybody a chance to get their products in it together, to get their designs together, to get through the certification process. Now, several people have already gone through that and taken care of that grant, but it's, uh, it is something to be aware of that that publisher that you might get a pushback if you start saying, "Hey, that's I got to have products that have, uh, are evaluated to that standard." Many times, my question. Another the next slide. So the scope of this standard is both for systems and components, and it's a whole bunch of them. There's the rack mounting systems, there's the mounting ground and ground mounting components, the clamping retention devices, and everything is for a specific manufacturer or a model designation of flat plate modules. Now, uh, the UL 1703. What that means is, is that when any of us certify one of these products. We are, it's to be matched specifically with a PV panel. It could be a group of panels, but it's got to be specifically connected with it because that's how it was evaluated for providing the proper grounding and bonding or fire classification or mechanical loading. 
Uh, they're for installation on or integral with buildings or to be freestanding, not attached to buildings. And, and bottom line, it says it's needs to be installed per the NEC. It's intended to be installed per the NEC and the model building code. Yes. Okay. When a product is listed in 2703, does that mean it's met all aspects of 2703, or can they pick and choose which aspects they want? Great, it's got a great lead-in. Let me go to the next slide. And, and it's actually one of the issues that we're having. So here's here's the thing. It's, uh, uh, let's get the first one out of the way. There's also a scope that says there for PV module systems with a maximum system voltage of 1,000 volts. I'm pretty confident that will probably change readily because of the 1,500 volts uh, now uh, uh, being in the code. So I, I would bet that there's going to be a uh, in the next edition that will be a proposal. So let's let's avoid that and let's let's go past that one. Let's look at the attributes. There are essentially four attributes that are addressed by the standard. One is grounding and bonding. Two is mechanical strength. Three is suitability of materials. I threw that in because it says it in the scope. And fire classification PV system. Let's look at it as grounding and bonding methods, uh, grounding and bonding path, mechanical strength, the mechanical loading, and fire classification. When we're looking at these three attributes, is, is that a manufacturer may come to any one of the certifiers and say, I just want to have evaluated for grounding and bonding. Why wouldn't they get the fire classification? Because fire classification is not required on every single building. So they may say, well, you know, I, I, that, I'm just going uh, gonna, to gonna roll the dice and I'm going to go for just those, that particular segment of the industry. Another is, is that why would they not go for mechanical strength? Why, why not go for mechanical loading? Because uh, they can go to jurisdictions that will say, oh, I will take, uh, I, I don't need that. I'm going to have a local PE uh, register PE to, uh, sign off, uh, do, do the calculations and sign off on the loading. Because what you'll find also in UL 2703 is that it's not addressing the structural integrity. That's AC 428. That's ICCES. That's their criteria. We're, uh, uh, so, so when you look at the listing, and if we dangerously go closer to this, but we have to go anyway, is it that what you should see in the listings is a set of anybody, it should be identifying what aspect of 2703 did they list? Did they list, uh, did they certify, I'll just put it generically, did they certify for the grounding and bonding only, for the mechanical uh, uh, loading only, for the fire classification only, or a combination thereof, either all three or, or two of them? It's got, it should be identified as part of the listing. Where, where do we find that information? Where, go down that path for a moment. Uh, is is that uh, the, the different organizations are going to do it in different ways. With UL, you're going to find it online on our certification directory. Uh, Sunny, how do you do it? You, do you, do you I, I think that's, that's why I was referring to earlier about how they're certified, how they're classified or listed. So I think that's why, in order to understand exactly if they comply with one of them or all four of the requirements and how you find it and stuff is, is the discussion about the designation is very important. Is the product recognized component? Is it a listed component? Is it a certified component? Or is it a classified component? So I think previously when John and I got into this business over 20 plus years, there was a term called classified. Classified meant you met certain requirements within the standard. You're not fully in compliance with every requirement of the standard. That's where the listed word came in. A listed product met every requirement of the standard. A classified product was classified to meet the required one or two requirements within the, so it was right, right there from the label. You didn't even have to go look at a directory or go in any detail right there. If it's a recognized component, it's recognized to be safe under certain conditions. It came with conditions of acceptability, so you know you need to ask for that. If it said classified, you knew it only met one or two or three, but not every requirement of the standard. As soon as the word listed showed up, now you're clear that knowing everything has been complied with, everything's been tested to. There's some new words lately that are floating around in the industry. One of them is certified. And I'm looking at John because UL started using the word certified. And they would call it certified whether it met one requirement or two requirements or three requirements. Then it requires you to go back to their directory or wherever that information is and verify what is it certified to. Is it certified to one of the four requirements or is it certified to three of the four requirements? But 
from intertype perspective, we're still following the old nomenclature where it's recognized, classified, or listed. So if it's not listed, it's not meeting every requirement of the standard. Recognized is a component. Classified is a system, but met part of, part of the requirement. But if it says the word listing, then you're sure it met all four of the requirements. And, and let's make sure we also understand that recognized component part, because there are various manufacturers who will say, and rightfully so, that they have a product that has been certified as it's a recognized component, and it's. What the recognized component means is, is that it's in completing construction features or it needs further evaluation for use in the end use product. Not for in the field, but for the end use product. And, if, and we might as well just be, be you know, straightforward on it. I mean, like a, a, an example would be a weave connector. A weave connector is a part of the system, therefore it's a recognized component, therefore it's only limited to those, in, those specific overall systems that have had that evaluated in it. What? Yeah, because the word certified right. came up. And, and I just wanted to mention that that's also, is that also a word that the CFA uses as opposed to listing or something? Certified is, is, is a, there's, there's going to be very interesting debates as we go forward. Certified is a, it is a, ge a general term of that you, the third party has some, has evaluated, tested, and determined that this product is meeting certain requirements of certification. But, um, Roy, the new, the, the new port issues that the committee is looking at, it, it goes specifically to some of the things that they're talking about. So we're going to get into more discussions on that, more detailed discussions, and come to some conclusion as to what is what, and what should AEJ be looking at. And, and what, what this, we, we branched off into areas that I was, I, I knew we would go to, but was hoping that we would be, we would be sticking to the standard. Because first of all, to understand the standard. And that, but yes, to, to understand the end result is understanding the certification methods, the, what is actually uh, identifying the certification. I think that, that for that, uh, and what I suggested was is that we have at the next meeting the uh, each of there's four certifiers of 2703 that I know of 2703 CSA, uh, TUV Rhineland, uh, Intertech, and UL. And the four of us that I, I think individually come up and say, let me tell you, this is where you find my certification. This is how you find it. This is how you interpret, and this is how you understand what the the markings on the product, but then it has this marking, it means this, this, and this. And I think that would be appropriate. Way One question on that. The manufacturers that have the product tested, they're given a report that would identify what, what, what has been tested, correct? Right. They are given an, uh, yes, but they don't want to be given a share in that report. Well, there's a very good reason. Why would I want to, as a manufacturer, I, I love what one manufacturer told me. He's, he described it as, I don't like putting my my report out in the wild because when it goes out, out, out in the wild, then what happens is when I provide something to you, then that's public information, right? So that public information means that it's available for all the competitors of that manufacturer. So it, what we try to do is to communicate everything through three vehicles. There's the installation instructions, there is the markings, and there is the guide information in our, in our directories, whether they be online directories or the UL White Book or whatever way, what method we use. So those, there should be really no reason, uh, unless you start having, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm really kind of concerned, if something seems odd here, there really should be no reason that you really need to have a copy of the testing report because it should already be communicated in those three methods I just told you. And two, now hold on, Pat, I'll come back. And two is, is that you shouldn't have, and there should be no reason for you to have or need to have a copy of the standard because all of the requirements that are in the standard that are needed to be known for doing an inspection are already distilled into 
to guide information. I agree with you as far as as far as a standard that sometimes an outline investigation, we don't know what was included if we're going to use that. We include that all that information when we certify to an outline investigation in the in the guide information on the UL website, there is also the, we do the same thing for outlines as we do for standards, and, and it includes that you can go directly to a scope, to, you can go to any one of the UL outlines or standards. You can view the scope of the document, and you can also view the table of contents of the document. So at least you have an understanding of what all the different tests that are, are Performed. One of the problems we have is we do try to use the installation instructions as the main basis for determining whether a product is, you know, after your use has been covered. But you may have installation instructions that show grounding and bonding, but it's not necessarily that it's grounding and bonding purpose. And so that's hey John. the problem. Showing you how to pull this together, showing you how to put where to put the grounding left and everything, but that doesn't mean that it's been tested for grounding and bonding. So what are we what are we doing? It, it, what, again, communicator, it sounds like Don Hughes. Was that Don Hughes that was if trying to speak? Do we get pull off? And, I mean, yeah, I, I got my hand up when you guys are done. You're hitting exactly what the discussions are going to happen in the next quarter. Yeah. So so I've seen. I've seen installation instructions like you were talking about the Weeb clip, and the Weeb clip had in their installation instructions, it said, when installed in accordance with the certification agreement, the listing report, and the correlative pages of the listing report and the certification agreement. And I, you, you're never going to get a hold of any of that as an AHJ. And currently, you have the RTE uh, rail list system that is saying that they're, that they're uh, I don't know whether they're saying they're certified or classified. Through, through Intertech for a mounting system, but they're not listed to to anything to, to, to 2703 that I know of, and they're just saying that we've only tested one module, and then we say all the modules that are shaped and sized like this. Now, how does an AHJ take from that perspective to say, okay, these products are listed to be used together when you have that kind of vague uh, in, instructions and, and information that the AHJ is getting? So I think that, the, that you guys all need to kind of work together just to not do that to the AHJ and make it really Don, clear to the AHJ what products go together. Don, let's divide the question. For the, for the weave connectors, UL has recognized the weave connectors, recognized component. There is not a UL mark on the product. There is a right, backwards R2, which is a recognized component, but there is not a UL symbol on the product. Reason we chose that because Again, if it's a recognized component, its real its its purpose is from factory to factory, from the component factory to the system factory. It is not something that is a uh, something that you can just pick it up and use in any system you 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 choose out in the field. Oh, okay. Well, because I, I want John to finish this presentation. Uh, all this info, it, 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 it'll feed into the discussions that we're actually going to continue to have on the final slide grade. This is good to get everybody thinking about all this and how there's, there's a solution to them. So you can, 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 I, up, can I ask one more question regarding what we are talking about up here? Yes. Is oh, there any no, consideration good. given when they test the product to the installer tolerance? Like what we're finding is we're having UL2703 products that are listed grounding and bonding, and they're installing them, and their tolerances, I don't know if they're testing the lab under stricter tolerances than when they get out in the field. If, if, if modules are an eighth of an inch, a sixteenth of an inch off center to where they're clamped down, you don't get grounding and bonding. And we have our inspectors going out there with, with continuity testers to find the problem. So if, the, okay, two things in there. Uh, first of all is Whatever the manufacturer says, this is my system, and these are the instructions, then what we're going to do is we are going to install that in accordance with those instructions, and we're going to perform the evaluations on that. And that's going to be, and if it passes all the tests, that's what it's got to be. Now, a, ma a smart manufacturer is going to be one who's going to build in various tolerances into their instructions. And if they do that, then and that's what it's going to be. We're going to be testing what they say. We're not going to we're not going to second guess and go, hey, you know, it says it says uh, you've got to have this uh, this eighth inch gap, 
and you know, what, well, let's try quarter inch. Let's let's try a half inch. We don't we don't do that. The manufacturer has to do that in their design. That's the problem. Uh, and, and that to me is is back to the manufacturers on the on their design that they have to, they should be considering building in those tolerances. Um, the second thing is is that if if a product is installed in accordance with the installation instructions, verbatim, they're installed for that instructions, and you're finding issues with it, <laughs> I know there would be a chorus from uh, from everyone who's certified would be saying, hey, if that was something I certified, I want to know it, I want to know where it is, I want to know uh, what it is, I'd be all over that to find out what's going on. Uh, absolutely. I, think, I, mean, I completely agree with what John said. We, we test it exactly to the instructions. And, and I think something I wanted to say when we were having the NAPSAP discussion, what we're seeing, it's not certification or taking a test and getting certified. The problems we're all having is training. There's a bigger need for training. These guys not following the instructions or not doing things in a certain way. And as I said, if you do see it being done by instructions and still doesn't meet the requirement, we want to know about it. We want to pull those things. We don't want our liability, our, our label on something that really doesn't meet the requirement. What's happening is when it's being tested in the laboratory in the perfect condition, perfect scenario. Right. Everything's buttered up nice together, everything is nice and tight and worked down. You get in the field, that's not what you're seeing. And you've got to expect a certain amount of leeway in the field because you're not going to get the same installation as you are in the laboratory. And it's creating issues. So, yeah. so Pat, you need to get pictures now. Pat, think you about this. About. Is this that you're on the SCP and you know how the standards put together, and there's not anything in the standards saying, okay, we're going to test it with various tolerances. If you feel that there ought to be those kind of tolerances, actually, you don't have to be a member of an SCP to make proposals to the standards. By the way, you can anybody, anybody in the world. My mom or my dad can make proposals. I don't know if they're going to, but uh, I doubt it. But but anybody could do that. Uh, but again, uh, yes, there are, one, one can uh, consider that there are certainly differences between lab conditions and, and factory, uh, lab conditions and field conditions. However, is, is that the, the lab conditions, if, they're, if, if we're not having the standard match, uh, match up with certain field issues that we think we need to address, they need to be addressed for the SCP. Again, the tolerance is those manufacturers should, should figure that out. So if I could make a quick comment, uh, we, this is Jeff Spees and I am the task group leader for the bonding and grounding task group on 2703, which is addressing just about every issue that you folks have brought up and if interested, I've got two slides that will give a quick summary of the scope of work that's already been identified for the two task groups, the one that will be uh, merging the bonding and grounding language for UL 1703 and 2703 as well as the task group that's focused on bonding and grounding for 2703. We had some substantive interaction this week in our task group meeting and I've got two slides I can show later that will outline what we're tackling. And, and, and I appreciate that Jeff, I think that's getting almost too detailed because I think that it's, uh, cause that's in flux. Uh, what we're trying to do is make, as I understood the, quest, the, the request from Hector and Paulo was to try to get more of what exactly is this overall for, for everybody to get on the board. You go to the next understood, slide, but, but the questions that are coming up, John, relate directly to the content that I'm discussing, so I'd be more than happy to show folks what we are addressing in the task group if that feels that would be beneficial and it sounds like from the comments and questions it would be. Get to and, and bear in mind is, is that, that you know this is SCP in process. Uh, there's various people in process. I, and let me just finish up so that I, I, of what Hector had asked. So I want to make sure we all. John. Sorry. John, one more. Can we go back uh, back to slide nine, please? And we kind of passed through it, and I, and I had a comment on that. One more. Go back one more. Yeah. yeah, in there on the first bullet it says uh, that the scope covers racking systems, uh, mounting and grounding components, clamp retention, um, manufacturer model designation for a flat pit plate to PV modules panels complying with 1703. Is that actually in the standard? Where is that um, where it defines that the model numbers for the PV modules um, need to be identified? So that's verbatim from section 1.1 of the standard. That's in the scope. This is, okay. this is that, 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 I made sure to copy exactly what 
stated in the scope. Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll take a look at that as soon as I get a copy of it. I was going to say, that's every standard. I mean, you have to identify what you're talking about. Yeah. But um, the question so, comes to the location of it, where it's, whether it's visible after installation. I don't think that was what Mark was asking. That was Mark, right? Yeah, that's Mark. Yeah, I was asking if, if the uh, model designations need to be um, identified during the evaluation. And then second, secondly, um, uh, you mentioned about where does this information reside uh, for the inspector at the end. Is that part of the listing that you would see um, from the uh, certifying site, or is that something that's required in the installation manual or markings, or where, where, do you, where does an inspector find that information? And that, and that was what I was saying is, is that the, the standard in the section on, on markings and installation instructions are going to say what markings have to be and uh, what markings there have to be and where they're, uh, where they're located. Um, as far as certification markings, that is not covered by the standard. Yeah. So the specifically standard. for... Um, so, so Sonny, I don't know for the marking section as to where the markings need to be. That's what, that's where it's going to be in the in the in the standard. I don't I don't have the the standard open in front of me, so I don't I can't quote chapter and verse of exactly where it is. Uh, but uh, uh, what what this is saying this is not what what the scope is saying is is that the manufactured and, and the, uh, the manufacturer model designation. Is, is that you can't? Is there's not a generic? In other words, there's not a generic rack system that you just say, "Hey, this uh, will uh, this standard covers a rack system that can be used with any PV system, I, any PV panel I so desire." It is. Mm -hmm. it, it, there's a specific linkage between the PV panel and the rack mounting system, or the mounting component, or the clamping retention device. Right. You Would you be able to? Doug, uh, John, heard it on that or not? No, I, I was just trying to hear what somebody was saying. I, I, I can read through the I got the marking section up here that says many. We're getting into a lot of weed. I know a lot of weed. details. But yeah, let's just uh, try if you can wrap it. Perfect. You you okay? If Mark, we need to talk further offline. Yeah. yeah I, I think maybe um, you're right. We're getting into the weeds. I'm being real specific about something. Um, let's let's talk after the meeting. That'd be fine. Okay. Um, so go to uh, my uh, what ten or eleven slides. I can't remember which where I was. Um, uh, there we go. I just want to make sure we all understand. I just want to make sure we also understand what 2703 doesn't cover. It doesn't cover uh, combiner boxes, wireways, and electrical enclosures that's taken care of by UL 1741. Doesn't uh, cover ground rods and rod accessories that's covered by UL 467. Doesn't cover uh, the uh, uh, solar tractor that's covered by 3703. Doesn't cover inverters and all that. This is just the racking system. So that's all, and this is all stated in the scope. This is all stated online. You can all access this. To see this. Does, does it cover bonding and grounding lugs that are specific for, for solar? Yeah, that would be a component. Okay. So that would be covered. Okay. Uh, actually, a couple of the manufacturers that make those components are members of the FCP. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think that was the last slide I had, was it? Okay. Thank you, John. Yeah, perfect. All right. John, can we get a copy of these slides? No. You can't. You'll have to ask Hector. You'll have to ask, actually, you have to be nice to Paula, and Paula might just might let you have it. Actually, this this whole session is recorded, so you can actually listen to this all over and watch it over again. Oh, don't! No, you don't uh, want to go through all that no, again. But we can we can identify the specific area clips, so you can go directly there. Um, one moment, though. Um, James does have a comment that he would like to address really quickly. Okay. Go ahead. He, he's online. James? Can you guys hear me? Yeah. yeah. Ah, fantastic. Uh, I was just uh, wanted to comment uh, regarding what John said about uh, classified systems versus uh, listed systems and systems that were classified uh, under the old outline of investigation. And if uh, he could perhaps speak to 
uh, the deadline of July 2016 uh, for those manufacturers that have existing uh, classified systems under the outline uh, and how that will affect, um, you know, for testing that's not yet completed to the standard. We've been having a lot of difficulty in various jurisdictions communicating um, that our existing classifications are, are still valid while testing is undergoing to update to the standard. So for us, in, in using uh, issue one, uh, where we had um, various ranges of module uh, sizes that were acceptable, and as we're getting various makes and models tested, we're in this limbo period in between, uh, and some jurisdictions are, are voicing objections uh, to accepting our uh, test reports to outlines of investigation, specifically issue one. I think, uh, and I'll let Sonny jump in as well, too, on this, because it goes either way. Um, I think that what people need to realize, one, is where is UL 2703 referenced and required in the, in the codes? It is, it is referenced in, it, it's not even referenced in the 2000, 2015 IBC. It will be referenced in the 2018 IBC, but it's, and it's not, it is in the Annex A of the NEC, but the Annex A is simply a, a, a informational annex. It's not a requirement. I, I, I regret that it's that way, but that's what it is. And the fact is, is that that um, the only thing you could I could you could point to is is the fact that the standard is saying this is its effective date. If a jurisdiction decides that they want something uh, to, uh, to be in compliance with that standard well before that date, exactly. that's that's, that's, that's they're going to be the jurisdiction exactly. doing that. Do that. But but what I would I would hope I would. I would hope to have a conversation with the with the jurisdiction and suggest you need to con uh, you know please consider that uh, you don't just the day after the NEC is published for the next edition you don't just start a, start applying it you actually have a period of time to allow manufacturers I, to. I adjust. think the question was more geared towards what are the differences between the standard and the outline specification and whether it addresses the issues that the jurisdiction may have. Otherwise, they're going to go back to conventional or rely upon methods. Well, one would have to go through side-by-side -side comparison and all that. I, I point to those, the statement of that there's substantially the requirements that are in the standard are substantially the same as what was in the proposal. So substantially, you know, and how far, how far do you want to, to to pick certain things out, uh, that's a great question. Um, I, I, again, I would suggest, like, uh, how critical is it to make it an issue right now? Well, well, I might mention that there's a pretty significant difference between the outline of investigation and the ANSI credit standard. The section 9.1, which addresses wet metal accessories need to be grounded, didn't appear until the ANSI accredited standard. So that would be one substantial difference. Well, let's, let's just hang on. Yeah, I think you need to go. We need to think this through. Think, be careful what you wish for, Jeff, because you just might get it. I'm not saying I wish for anything. I'm only saying that that's a substantial difference, John. All right, with that, let's jump. Sonny, <laughs> thank you. And Sonny, he, he took up all your time. I know, I didn't. And he knew he was right. He was exactly. in a bad shape, bad shape to be behind me. I, I knew, but I agreed. I, I brought you in. Before me, then that's what was going to happen. I, I brought you into the discussion, thank though. You. All right, that was John, thank you. No, I, no, I think, no, I'm glad John was speaking earlier, so we got a lot of the controversial issues discussed <laughs> out of way, so we can specifically concentrate on testing. So my presentation, let me go to the next slide, um, just walk you through all the tests that are specifically required in the standard. So you're aware of what testing was done in the lab when the product was listed, classified, certified. We'll have that a little later. But you know, any other, once it carries that certification mark, there's a whole bunch of tests that, that are done. And as John said, the, the, within the standard, there is the construction requirements. And then there's the testing requirements and marking and follow-up test, uh, follow testing requirement that happens before the product is shipped out of factory. So these are the tests that are done in the lab. And how we determine what test needs to be done is based on 
what we call construction evaluation. So we do a construction evaluation of the product against construction requirements, depending on how the product is built, what type of material, how it's secured, what type of rating it, it's uh, designed to be used with from module perspective and and, and uh, uh, the bonding and grounding. And that's what you base the test on. So that's the list of the tests. Next slide, please. I'll go through each one of them one by one. One of the main tests that we've been talking about is the, is the grinding, grounding pass resistance test. Again, the purpose of this test is to make sure all dead metal parts are, are properly grounded. So if they're, they're properly grounded and they're able to carry the, the, the ground fault current, there's a, there's a proper pass for that. Uh, the, the, the way this test is done is that you're applying, the, as a first line there, all dead metal parts that's Testing after both before and after immunity pre and and uh, temperature cycling. So you do this test on an as-is sample as it comes to us. Then we put them through what we call accelerated aging tests. Is what we refer to the grounding, the humidity freeze, and the temperature test. And I'll give you details for those in a couple of slides. And then once the sample comes out of that, then you repeat this test. And the, the requirement is that the resistance has to be less than point. And the way we are not just using a regular multimeter to measure that, you're actually running current through the device, uh, which is equivalent to twice the fuse rating of a module that is intended to be used with. This goes back to what I was saying, construction evaluation. That's where you determine what that test is. So there are modules that are rated 15 amps, there are modules that are rated 25 amps. So on a 15 amp module rated product, you'll run 30 amps through the, the whole downlink circuit. You measure the voltage drop and calculate the resistance. It has to be less than 0.1. Is there any salt testing involved? Yes, yeah. that's clear. That kind of stuff, yeah. yeah. So, so the next slide, please. Uh, the torque test. This is uh, to, in the interest of time, just to, just to get through it quickly. We would install it for the instructions with the amount of torque that's required by the installation instructions and Tighten it and, and go through that process ten times. Tighten the, the, all the all the torque, loosen it back up, tighten it back up ten times, and there should be no visual, you know, breakage, displacement, and things of that nature. And this is only again done on the on the, the product or the component where there's specific torque requirement. All right, next slide, please. This is the fire testing. So, and you see the 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 guide on the side, that specifically just refers to there is a type testing requirements for modules. If I go from type 1 to, you know, it goes on top to type 15. But, but what you're looking at is if the module is already type tested, then you follow one route of testing. If the module is not type tested, you follow the other route. But once you have met these requirements, uh, they're tested differently for get uh, down in this area, you have a, a low slope system goes through one right, one, one uh, test criteria, and if you have a, a, a steep slope system, it goes to a different different test criteria. In a, in a steep slope system, then it divides again, is it symmetrical or, or, or asymmetrical system? How is it installed on the, on the roof? So the different test requirements, by meeting those requirements, you get the, the, the system or certified as class A, B, or C. Next slide, please. So these, these are the tests. The two tests that are done is, is what is called spread of, spread of flame test, and the other one is called the burning brand test. So the spread of flame test on a steep slope system, like the one you would see on a residential roof. It, it's a spread of flame test is done, we call it the south edge, but it's basically the leading edge when you looking at the module from the from ground. And the, the way this test is done, you're assuming the, the, the roof is on fire and there's a, the, the, the details in the test is like 12 miles wind pushing the flame over the over the module. And you see how far it spreads and that's why it's a spread of flame test. It was that one and then you repeat it on, on two different samples. The burning brand test is where instead of the roof being on fire, there's the amber or the piece of you know, burning wood falls on the module from an adjacent building or an adjacent structure and falls directly onto the module. That's what that is intended to simulate. And in that, also, there are two, 
food test, one where the burning brand is placed on top of the module and see if it burns through. And in the other test, it's placed between the module and the roofing material. And the size of the brand is three different sizes, A, B, or C. And when it's, when it's placed between the module and the roof, <coughs> it's always the, the, the B class burning brand, the middle size. Uh, and that trying to simulate the debris getting stuck between the module and the roof and catching on fire. Or a squirrel burning, a very squirrel making or something like that. Uh, again, that's sort of the next slide. Um, wait, can we stick? Can we go back to that slide? Sure. Thanks. Um, on the spread of flame, that's um, you're simulating uh, a condition where the roof is on fire. Is that correct? Yes. Um, how does how do you address something like a metal seam roof with uh, this kind of condition? Is that is is a metal seam roof exempt from this, or do you still have to do the, the spread of flame test with that situation? I think the, the so from our testing perspective, we're testing it for for all application. As we you know, if there's a consideration for the type of roof it's sitting on, that's really the. The, the building department or the fire department determined once it gets up on the roof. We're, we're testing it for, it, it, it's, uh, most of the modules are being tested for class A roof because if it's tested for class A, then you can use it on a class B or C depending on if the, if the, if the board allows that in, in that region. And, but if you test it for A, you're good for all class B and C, so most everyone is getting test, uh, testing their modules for, for class A roof. Okay. That, you know, in, in testing, we don't take that into consideration, no. Uh, fire oh, classification, thanks. fire classification, how it's applied is, uh, that would be yet another 15, 20, well, actually, half hour, hour discussion, so. Let's go on. If, just one, <laughs> one thing I will point out is that if you want to see all that predicated the fire testing requirements, you can go to solarabcs.org and on that website are posted all of the research that was done uh, over five years to establish what the issue was that were being addressed and how and what uh, uh, why uh, it basically gives you an insight as to why the code the standard has the requirements that it has. Yep. Next slide is for the low slope roofs. And there you're looking at a system because the low slope roof, like a warehouse or something, you're looking at a symmetrical insulation or asymmetric insulation because sometimes they're sitting at a certain angle. So when they're sitting at, at a certain angle, at asymmetric insulation, you got your profile is different for the fire to approach the module. So in that case, the test is done three times. It's done from the front of the module, from the back of the module, and from the side of the module. Because all three profiles are different, the flame would spread differently, would, would approach the module differently. On a, on a symmetric roof, it's very similar to what was done with a, with a steep slope system. But when it comes to an asymmetric system, it, it's repeated six times, two times from each direction, the, the spread of flame test. Because again, the profile is, is different in all three years. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the gasket test. This is only done on the module. Actually, racking and mounting systems don't have a lot of this. This is on uh, tractors have this. A lot of the tracking systems have gaskets and, and things of that nature. So there are requirements, there are ASTM requirements that the standard refers to, where you do a test for an as is sample, then put it through conditioning, and then, then do the same test again to make sure it, it meets the requirements there. I've referenced the specific tables where it talks about what condition you put it in and how much of the, the degradation is allowed in these gaskets or the, uh, the seals that are used. Next slide, please. This, this is the very rarely done. I don't think we spend a lot of time here. Uh, these are the tests that are the most common ones, the cycling test. This is what creates the 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 accelerated aging process where we do the grounding impedance test before and after. So this particular one was based on a temperature cycling and the samples are subjected to 200 cycles of this where the, the system the, or the, the system is placed in a, in a chamber that's going from minus 40 degrees C to plus
plus 85 degree C, and these are six hour cycles. And you put it through 200 cycles. And you repeat the, the grounding impedance test before and after. So if there is any kind of corrosion or displacement or contraction or expansions and all that, this is where this is where the the rubber meets the road where things start to fail the test. Yeah, so I was going to say, do you find any failures or do manufacturers typically do this similar testing before they even take it to the user test? Uh, less and less. There used to be more and more failures earlier. Now we're not finding as many, though. No. Uh, let's be honest, there are not too many new players coming to the market. Everybody has gone through one or two sets of tests in the past and they've learned from it. So the newer products that are coming out with are not failing as much as the, as the initial ones. In, in any product, the manufacturer is a uh, smarter manufacturer is going to be one who's going to do their homework before they even submit the product. And a lot of them did not in the beginning. We, we you know, even in the module cases, we used to have a lot of modules that used to fail a lot, a lot of tests, but not as much. Not to say that there aren't failures. Oh, there's still failures. But, but, failures. but the fact is, is that not as many. Exactly. Uh, the other conditioning test that's in 2703 is what's called the humidity freeze. It's the same. Temperature variation, next slide please. It's the, the same temperature variation from uh, minus 40 to plus 85, but in this case it's with 85% humidity. So you're freezing onto it and then thaw it and freeze it, and in this particular case it's only 10 cycles. The modules go through a 50 cycle test, same exact test for 50 cycles. And then if some of you are also looking into IEC testing or looking at the equivalent of what goes on in the rest of the country, the rest of the countries or regions, they also have a third test that's called uh, damp heat. And in damp heat tests, they don't go to the negative 45, they stay at 85 degree, 85 percent humidity for 1,000 hours. So they add a third test, which is not required by 1703 or 2703 right now. But which, which, uh, which, again, I'm just letting you know, is something that, that might come because it is required by the IEC standards. But here it's 10 cycles. Uh, I'll just go through it as 50 cycles. It's 10 cycles minus 40 plus 85 with 85% humidity. And again, at the end of this, you repeat the, ground, the, the grounding impedance test again, the one I showed you on the very first slide, where you're running, you know, three times the, the rated amperage and the the resistance needs to be less than 0.10. This is the salt spray test that you were talking about, Ben. So, in the salt spray test, some of the details are, are there. Basically, you are comparing the samples to a G90 seal. And this is only done on the product where it's a painted product or a galvanized product. Aluminum and stainless steel, the 300 degree stainless steel are exempt from, from this test. Or plastic. You don't need to do this test on those. This is only on the galvanized steel or the painted steel product. You you scry the product, both the, the specimen as well as the the, the the test sample that you're putting in there. A six inch groove on it. You put it into a salt environment, into a salt chamber, and then you watch it until it, it corrodes. And you see which one of the two corrodes first. If they both corrode at the same time, it's a competitive test to a specimen of G90 steel that you put in comparison to the one you're testing. But these tests are done with, in conjunction with a module that is in the right, correct? Uh, no, this is done just on the sample of the of the steel that, that you're using in your uh, in your How do you know there are issues? How do you know there are issues with grounding and bonding to the module if the, the test is not subject to the... Yeah, the salt spray, by our standard, the test is only required on galvanized and painted material of the racking and mounting system. With the modules, it's the, it's the grounding impedance test where you go through thermal cycling and humidity freeze and all that. That's where you have all the members, including the, the, the frame. The, so it's just the salt test, that, that it is, or it's just the rack that is subject to the salt test? Not the material only, not the complete rack. Okay. You're not subjecting the actual connection point, like the torque test that I was talking about, that you do it 10 times to see if it doesn't fail or break or something. It's not all those components. It's not the complete assembly with the with the nuts and, and washers and everything in it. No, this is just the railing material or just the the, the frame material. You know why that was the case? Why didn't they test it as simply with the salt spray? We can. Uh, 
That's something we can bring in up at the SDP and see how we can we can get their answer of it. We can we can go to the discussion for a long time from what I think my reasoning is, or or you have to make some comments on it. But I think this is something that needs to go back to the SDP to discuss if this you know needs to be a test for the whole. We better we better run that down San Diego County with some some samples of, of traditional grounding methods out of strip spears. Went back a month later and have them with this. Well, uh, Pat, uh, I'm the task group leader for corrosion, and I would certainly welcome your involvement in that task group, in part because we've got some fairly complex issues that we don't have any easy answers, and sadly, we've struggled to identify qualified individuals from the metallurgy field that could help us in defining test pr protocols. So I'm open to suggestions from the group to figure out this really challenging problem. Uh, bear in mind... Bear in mind that, there's, that these task groups, uh, you know, there's various task groups. The task groups can have anybody involved, but the ultimately is it all goes back to the overall standard technical panel of 55 people, and those 55 people are going to decide what actually needs to go in the standard or what doesn't. Yeah. Uh, this, uh, this is James. Uh, just wanted to say uh, I'd be happy to contribute on the task group for corrosion, and some of our vendors have specifically. Uh, expressed interest in joining the task group uh, for um, some of the issues that uh, not only what Pat has brought up, but just um, right now the limited choices for um, uh, material coatings that are outlined in, in 2703 that uh, there might be superior coatings available, but they you know require a, uh, a different testing path or they're, they're not specifically stated in 2703 creating some problems. So I've had interest from vendors of ours um, regarding uh, corrosion specialists say, you know, how can we become more involved and, and I can get those people in contact with you and the, the SDP and the task group. All right, that's wonderful. I appreciate that. Send me an email and we'll get working on it. And Jeff, I too would, uh, would be happy to help out if you feel like you contribute. This is great. Yeah, Craig, absolutely. And again, just uh, email me and I'll go ahead and start to put you, get, populate you on the list and we'll uh, start to tackle this challenging issue. And, and Sonny, I'm certain that we can count on Intertech uh, being pretty engaged in this discussion also because it has been a vexing question for so many people. And, and likewise, John Tacker at UL, uh, you know, I, I hope that both organizations can help give us a little bit of guidance in an issue. The big challenge we have right now is defining the uh, how to add new materials. There's no procedure to do so. Uh, absolutely, I think we'll, we'll definitely be involved because you know. So the one thing I would I would just question is is that Jeff, is this in your in already the scope of this test task group that was established, or uh, it would seem like it would be a good idea to also let the project manager of the standard of the overall STP, which would be Susan Malone, to know what things are being worked on, because then it, then we make sure that nothing gets uh, through the track cracks. I just want to make sure people, when they're making proposals, you think about making the proposal to the STP. I mean, yes, uh, in fact, in task group work from from day one when these task groups were established after the ANSI accredited standard came into existence, uh, we've had a defined scope of work that does address uh, the issues that we're talking about here. So it's it's a known entity. Susan's been, you know, of course, in, involved in all those email threads that have taken place. And uh, uh, the dilemma, again, John, is that we've struggled to identify those subject matter experts that can really help us clarify the, what the established scope of work is. And Jeff, and I think we'll, we'll follow the procedures. We'll make sure everything is documented properly, and then all these questions, you know, just want to make sure nothing gets lost. That's all. Absolutely, I think. Well, and and, and, and John, I've I've been copying you for, for the moment, at least on all the bonding and grounding task group the emails. That is the method that we're using to notify folks of these of this activity. Uh, on the corrosion, we haven't yet started the meetings, in part because uh, we've struggled to identify those subject matter experts. So possibly. The, the folks that uh, James mentioned would, would fit the, the bill and we could make some progress on what is established scope of work issues. Okay. Back to your presentation. All right. So okay. back to the presentation again, as I said uh, earlier, this presentation is specific to what's in the standards. I'm glad all these questions are coming up. What's not there, what needs to be there, and we take that back to the STP. Uh, so salt spray, you put a specimen of G90 with the actual sample and you watch them until they corrode and see which one corrodes first and the failure is that G9, it should be an equivalent to G90, not worse than that. That was the requirement. Um, 
just just on the on the new materials and stuff from from our perspective, I'm sure you will. Uh, when something is not specifically in the standards, overall for the standard, if something is not specifically in the standard, and we see a lot of it coming from the industry, new product coming from the industry, what we do is is, is an internal risk assessment of that product. So we actually do develop requirements outside the standard and certify products to those by pulling requirements from other existing standards or other industry norms and, and test things to those. And, and, and there has been new products that have been tested and certified. And that's where we bring value into the STB where we've done some of those things even before they are published into the standard. And, and that's how that information gets in there from, from research perspective and all that. All right, let's next, uh, next slide, please. Uh, again, this is very similar. This is same exact requirement as I said on the salt spray, but this is also uh, done for the, the most car carbon dioxide and sulfur dioxide test. Done exactly the same way the expectation is that it should meet the equivalent of G90C. Same test procedure, just putting it into a different environment. Instead of putting it in, this, in a salt spray environment, you're putting it into a uh, carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide environment. Next, uh, next slide, please. This is the one the metal uh, metallic coating thickness test. Uh, this is, again, specific to uh, the material where we want to make sure that coating is uniform. And the requirement is the coating, I think uh, Jeff was just talking about that, or, or, or someone on the phone, or James. Uh, the 0.61 mil is what the requirement is, the average coating. And at a particular point on the entire specimen, no reading should be less than 0.54 mil, but the average should be 0.61 mil. And there are specific methods that you could use to measure that thickness and document that thickness, and that's what goes in the report. And when those kind of details go into the listing report, I can understand why people don't want to share the listing report outside because that, you know, how you did it, what method you used, what your thickness is. A lot of guys don't like sharing it. So there's an X-ray method, there's the eddy current method, there's the, the way of way of coding methods. At Intertech we use the eddy current method to, to measure that that thickness. But it is it is one of the tests that's done that's required. Next slide please. This is the mechanical loading test. Uh, the mechanical loading test is done with the module that you specify. Your your uh, backing and mounting system is certified for, and it's 10 pounds per square feet on the face of the module, 5 pounds per square feet on the back of the module, and 5 pounds per square feet on the slope. And that's really just for snow loading in a in a, in a steep, steep insulation environment. And I mean, most of the basically the passing criteria is that it should not deform or break or or have some permanent uh, damage to the module or the racking system. But, but the, the tests are done so many different ways. I mean, there are, uh, sometimes we do these tests with, uh, with air balloons that you pressurize with the air balloon. Uh, there are some where we do a, put a, a plastic membrane and fill it with water to get that distribute, you know, even distribution, which is the best way of doing it. We also do it with sandbags and we also do it with lead pallets and all that. In my 20 plus years, 25 plus years of doing this, I think the most uniform you get is with water. If you get a nice ladder laying on top of the module, fill it up with water, you get a very nice, you know, uh, 10 pound per square feet distribution. But this is done 10 pound on the face of the module, 5 pound on the back of the module. Okay, I think we're almost at the end. This is the bonding conductor test, and I'm sure there might be a lot of discussion on this also because we had a big discussion about this on yesterday's call, uh, yesterday's STV call. Uh, this was the test. The way it's written in the standard is, is really that, that two specimens are expected to carry 135% or 200% of the rating of the intended branch circuit breaker. For how long and, and how you power it, where there was a discussion, that's the, that's the second bullet there, that uh, if you do this with a power supply of 250 volts, with a 5,000 amp available for the short circuit current. And there's been a lot of discussion on it, you know, the, but right now this is how the test is being done. With applying five, you know, power from a 5,000 amp power supply and just running it until, until the, the, you know, the, the failure or, or until you see the power of the requirement. Versus just having a circuit breaker in the, 
in the circuit and then the test is only a few seconds or a few microseconds or something. But this, this is something that's just been pretty controversial from STB's perspective and some of the, the industry experts, at least from the UL perspective. You know, uh, Chris has been very specific about this needs to be done with a power supply that has that much load on it. It needs to be continued for, for a certain amount of time. Uh, this test does come from an inverter 1741 half-bit test, and it, in a lot of cases, you know, it was it was done differently there. But it's a requirement that is that's done on every every uh, product, and this is the diff this is the big difference. Oh, with James was asking that this is one big difference from testing perspective between the outline of investigation to the actual standard. This bonding conductor. Uh, test was not in the outline of investigation. It is in the it's in the standard. So this is one of the big difference from stand, testing perspective. Okay. This is the last one, the bonding strap pull test. Again, this is just like any strain relief test we do on a cord, on a cord connected equipment or something. This is to make sure the bonding strap. If somebody, you know, pulls on it, carries something by a strap, or make sure it, it, it's able to carry with sand that that fold with that. So uh, you basically load it for one minute and make sure there's no damage and there's still continuity after a one minute loading test on a strap, on a bonding strap. Okay, that's it. Those are all the tests that are required in there. But uh, as I said earlier, I think one of the, the, the three that are most important one is the grounding impedance before and after those weather conditioning and then the, the loading test and uh, this uh, grounding strap, the, the grounding resistance of the second last that I was talking about, that's still being discussed what the actual power rating you want to use for doing that test. Sunny, John, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. I know everybody's hungry, but um, issues five to eight that uh, this committee is currently looking at. Um, a lot of questions that come up, a lot of the uncertainty, I, I, I believe um, this would be a great opportunity to try and tackle those. And there's going to be a lot more discussions. And Paul is going to talk about you know, the time frame to do that and an extension. And uh, so let's take a break, grab our lunch, uh, five minutes, and then we'll continue. Uh, I want to get everybody out of here on time. Sound good? Good. All right.
Hey Jeff, uh, you you still on the? Uh, can you actually hear me? Um, wondering if you got my uh, my message thing on on here uh, regarding the uh, the CCSC, if that's still going on the code and, uh, code. It is, standard. but I haven't got the meeting coordinated uh, recently. I, I do need to get that under control. And this is Alan speaking, I think, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I think the problem is that. Um, we're having a problem with the question box here, Alan. I'm not sure if that might be where you... That, that might be it, yeah. I can't access it for some reason, which is the first time in my use of GoToMeeting that's happened. So oh. I'm not, I've tried logging out and in a couple times. I can use the chat feature. And I oh, that's actually what I used. Yeah, I, I used like a, a private message thing, but I don't know if that actually made it through. Yeah, it doesn't look oh, like... Oh, what it, is that? What is that? I'm looking at somebody's phone there. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. That was hard to tell what well, it was. The, 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 the good news is that uh, we can talk to each other. So uh, what was the <laughs> yeah, – the codes and standards, um, we will definitely be getting that launched. Obviously, there's been a lot of substantive activity since our last formal meeting two or three months ago now. Uh, and I'll try to get something on the calendar promised by – See today's Thursday. I'll try to get this announced by tomorrow to give everybody like a week and a half or so. Uh, and really, what we'll likely do is summarize a lot of the work that you've already been engaged with, with the activities with SEAC, uh, with some sure. of the evolution of 2703. Uh, those are probably the most substantive issues I've seen in the realm of codes and standards. And AB 21, right. AB 2188. Although that's a permitting issue, it certainly ties into the general category. Okay. Yeah, I was just curious. Um, yeah, just because hey, Alan, I, hey, Alan, I thought did, about it. Did I get you on the invite list for this event we're holding up in Humboldt to, in mid-October, the Solar Pioneer Party? Uh, I don't. I, I haven't actually heard of it, so I don't think okay, so. <laughs> I'll, I'll email that to you right away. Oh, okay. Right. Sure. Thanks. And also, Don, I really appreciate the uh, the gloating of where you are right now yeah. by a pool. Thanks for that. It, uh, was that a pool or that wasn't the ocean there? No, that was just a pool. Okay. If if he got a an ocean side view, then I'd be even more jealous. I think he's not terribly far from the ocean, so I think he does a lot. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You have to hold the computer up over the edge of the fence, right? I could go. Out <laughs> I, I could go to my pool too in my backyard, but I'm just gonna stick with my office. It's a little easier to work here. <laughs> yeah. You done? Oh, now he's in his office. Uh. Uh, I think you're on mute. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't know if he's trying to talk to us or not. I don't think so. I think he's doing business. No. Can you yeah. hear me now? Oh, oh now yeah, we can. I muted yeah. myself. I was saying that was my break room. We went on break. I was, uh, I was, I was on, officially on break <laughs> there. So nice, nice. nice. <laughs> Yeah, my break room's right outside the door there. That was my, that was my pool, living the dream in Florida. I don't think that my office would. I don't yeah. think that my office would look good at all compared to all you folks. <laughs> well, just turn your camera on and let us be the judge of that. Yeah, no, it's, it's just a meeting room. It's just you a meeting room guy. behind me. Oh, okay, blank. I've got my PV panel, so I'm representing solar all the way. Yeah. And my ukulele right there. Oh, and look at those plaques. That's pretty sweet. What are you, a judge there? <laughs> yeah, I see a gavel. He's a judge and a cop. I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> pretty sweet. So are you all settled in now, Don? Yeah, I'm all settled in. All right. How did uh, yeah, you didn't see that one. This one, this one here, this this top one, that's a, that's a Krav Maga certificate from the uh, the head of the oh, International God. Krav Maga Federation. Yeah. Kind of like a, a martial art. Eyal Yanilov. <laughs> Is that a martial art? Yeah, it's no, it's it's people. actually a. Yeah, it's a, it's not a martial art. It's martial arts like the middle level. That's a uh, uh, Israeli hand to hand combat. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a fighting system. That, Got it. Terrifying. It took. The, it doesn't have an art in the in the in the category actually. <laughs> Fighting dirty, basically. Is that what it is? They teach how to fight dirty. 
Yeah, yeah. Up. Everybody gets a kick. Everybody gets a kick in the groin right off the bat and a poke in the eye. <laughs> Thanks for the warning. I think I'll avoid those meetings. <laughs> yeah. I'm a lover. I'm not a fighter. <laughs> yeah. That's why I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure I fit in either category. I'm not sure my office because it's filled with guns. <laughs> <laughs> so I noticed the, uh, the guitar is sitting behind you, Jeff. Why aren't you uh, providing an instrumental during the during the lunch hour here? Providing what? Yeah. Instrumental. There's a guitar behind you, Jeff. You're not providing music, and we need some ambiance while we watch these people eat. It's like intermission music. <laughs> Well, I'm multitasking. I'm trying to send out some of these uh, uh, invites to key people. So, uh, mm. it, yeah, I'll, I'll get this over to you here momentarily, Alan. It'll be a good thing for you. Yeah, well, sure. Multitasking. That's the that's the big word for doing nothing all the way. Yeah. <laughs> I think you guys have seen enough of my ugly mug for this afternoon. I'm gonna. But no, people don't want to look at this while they're eating. <laughs> no. I feel like I'm the only one who's actually in the. Uh, and the office office. I kind of wish I did this from home. <laughs> you know, it is, is kind of nice office. working from home. Yeah. Thank you. you know. I'm definitely in an office office. Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't feel too bad. And, and I'm in Cincinnati. I'm nowhere near a pool or an ocean. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Hey, James, definitely get me those uh, people's names and contact information. Ideally, we're going to get somebody who's like a friggin' Ph.D. in metallurgy and has studied corrosion their entire career. That's what we need. I'm just hoping for people who work for steel vendors. That's a start. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I sent you one already, uh, and I'm going to hit up some other folks um, and see if we can get people who have experience on, on steel coatings. For what it's worth, and I think some of the people here might be aware of this already, but uh, when we started to research the corrosion chart that's shown in the standard, it's used in multiple UL standards, so it's a standard chart. The problem was that there was no source information as to how those numbers ever got on that chart, what the tests that were used, and it appeared it like, might be an amalgamation of several charts. So that, 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 that chart's an old, old leftover from NASA in the 60s. Yeah, that's what we. I, it, I don't know. I don't know why they're not making these racking systems out of hemp these days. It's the damn steel industry that put hemp out of business <laughs> in the first place. A bunch of bullshit. Gee, gee, I'll tell you what. We might be making a shitload more stuff out of hemp before too long with the way things are going. But um, right now, I, I think that hemp might be a struggle just from a flammability perspective. And uh, we do have, uh, uh, I think. Uh, some interested participants for the corrosion task group, but nobody yet that has that long experience in evaluating corrosion issues and how to develop a test to figure out where a new material goes on that list. I don't know that that, that chart is probably the, that chart might not be the best way to do it. I don't know. Maybe it is. But uh, right now, it might be better to revamp the system to make it more of a, uh, to make it a testing, a, a go-no-go -go testing. Everything yeah, that I've learned. Uh, go ahead. As I say, Jeff, we work closely with a number of guys that are just, you know, that's all they do is corrosion experts. I mean, they, you know, they're spectacular to work with. They know their stuff. They don't believe it. That'd be great, um, Greg. Well, if you can get them to be willing to volunteer an hour every couple weeks to try to hammer these issues home. What we're really hoping for above all else is that there's a precedent that's been established by a recognized group, organization, company as to how to evaluate potential corrosion. And, uh, you know, again, with all of the work that we've done, we've even gone to NREL and they pulled in some of their people, but they they did. They weren't really able to address some of the core issues, such as you got two dissimilar materials sitting in an oceanside location. How long does it really last? We don't really have that kind of data. Uh, yeah, NASA did so much work on that when they first put in the, you know, the space center, Kennedy Space Center. They did a huge amount of work on it. And there's probably and, some. Uh, that, yeah, that we could go pull from NASA, but I guess a lot of those guys are probably retired and not really engaged any longer. I don't know. I know um, I'm trying to remember who these, these guys are working with. We were working with several of them, and they uh, 
they kind of come from all over the place. Hard to, uh, I forget where they're all from. Well, those would be the perfect guys, in my opinion. If we can get that, in fact, that was what I thought when we first started talking. And I, I, I worked with a company called Marine Fasteners, which, by nature of the name, would make you think that they're pretty experienced in corrosion, and they are. But the marine corrosion issue and PV corrosion are two totally different animals. Because yeah. in marine corrosion, all they do is they throw sacrificial anodes wherever there's a point of corrosion and manage it. And PV doesn't have the easy ability to do that because of all the different points of connection that would require a sacrificial anode that would have to be routinely replaced. Yeah, that's true. So those are, that's the core of the challenge that we're struggling with, and which is why we want to find somebody who could say, oh yeah, in NASA, this is the testing we did, here's the parameters and the procedure, and then we could just apply that ideally to all these new materials that companies like yours or James want to introduce to meet the standard. James, who are you with? I'm with RBI Solar. Okay. A lot of our vendors, Jeff, have expressed to me that you know, they have coatings or things that are more sophisticated or, or better performing that are what is in the standard. And we've actually had to revert to um, older things, uh, older types uh, or, you know, ASPM A653 type components uh, just because there's a lack of, uh, of a testing methodology for how do I get new materials in, things from Japan, things from Europe. Uh, there's a little bit of confusion there and then there's concern that somebody from uh, you know an AHJ will say hey this is not part of the standard and then freak out uh, so I, at least I can get those vendors in but yeah in some cases we had to change what we would have used to something that in theory is less corrosion resistant because of what's written in the standard and how currently in touch yeah. is. Yeah it's frustrating to me too James and the it, it reminds me of the same challenge we have on fire classification where if you use a standing seam clamp right to the module, there's legally no way to fire classify that unless you then take that standing seam and put it over the top of asphalt shingle or a, or a low slope membrane, which nobody does. So it doesn't make any sense. That's the So you're kind of having to bastardize the process to comply with the requirement. In your case, you just can't use a material, which might be better. Yeah, it's a challenge. And, and so... Um, if you send me, Craig and, uh, and James, the contacts that you feel would be able to contribute to this discussion, wow, that will be greatly appreciated, particularly if they have that extensive background. So, Craig, if you know anybody that might be tied to NASA where we could try to identify somebody, they have to be willing to do the work for free. That's the other challenge. Right. Yeah, that's always the challenge. I'll, I'll reach out to them and see what kind of response I can get. Yeah, but, you know, appeal to their, you know, better sensibilities about the future of PV and the contribution they can make to clean uh, renewable energy. If, if you have another case, we're going to restart and try to wrap this up for the next half hour. You guys ready? Yeah, sure. Okay, good. Hey, folks, we're going to, you can keep on, you guys can, you guys can keep on eating, and uh, we're going to uh, get going on. I want to go back to item number seven, and that's progress on the first four issues that uh, we cast the uh, committee tackle. And just uh, yeah, if, if, it's your, if it's your sole source. Yeah. Go back to the presentation. We talked about, talk about the process where we have the four groups, the four groups that then tackle the issues, and then we brought the main components, the solutions for the four and we put them one document, and the main is the main solutions were underlined, the big topic, big concept. And the next step now is to take that and write uh, a single briefing uh, paper, briefing notes. In our last meeting, we asked for volunteers that could help us do that. And uh, at SBI, I uh, went to Frank, with Frank and John, and they volunteered Chris. <laughs> and we were very happy to have Chris help us write those briefing notes, and also Don Hughes from the CSE is going to help. So the, they're going to take the work that's been done already and the concepts that were agreed that were underlined and write a, 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 a final briefing note. And then uh, it's going to go through a couple of peer reviews. Paul and I will, will look at it first, and then we'll bring it to the committee as a draft. So everybody will have a chance to uh, get into the nitty-gritty, into the details before it gets published and, and made it, make it available to the public. 
Will that include the comments that we brought up at our last committee? Because like I brought up four items in, that, in our discussion last month. Will that be incorporated in that? If, if we miss anything, please be sure. Oh, I'll remember. I'll remember. remember. You, you remind us, and uh, we'll be sure that... I'm an elephant. I don't forget. Good, good. So we'll be sure that that gets incorporated. But if we wanted something, you know, a script, and Dr. Hughes is going to be working on that. We want to make sure that, you know, they're not looking for a bias perspective. It's just based on the work that's been done already. And then, we'll, and of course, everybody have a chance to take a look at it in detail. So that's items one through four. Paula, you want to talk about items five through eight? Sorry, I know you're chewing on. <laughs> yes. Well, I just is Adam Fields online. Uh, yeah, I'm here. Hi. Oh, hi, Adam. I wanted to um, quickly pull you in. I know that uh, the last month has been really busy, and um, your group was basically the only one that uh, did quite a bit of the work. So I wanted to ask you if you could give us a status update on where your group is. Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, basically, what it all came down to, uh, I, I guess, let's start off with uh, with number seven. We've we've had a few meetings on the phone. Uh, thanks again to Chris for uh, for covering uh, John Clark. Um, so regarding uh, number seven, uh, our listing slash classification reports and installation instructions in compliance with UL twenty seven oh three. A lot of what we were talking about was how. Um, we generally, we as in installers and AHJs often do not know what um, reports and installation instructions are actually, or I guess what portions of a UL standard um, a product has been tested to. So it was mentioned earlier that uh, most of the um, most of the authorization to mark and certificate com of compliance documents out there don't actually state whether a product has been tested only for fire or for grounding and bonding or mechanical or what combination. So we are often seeing that jurisdictions and installers don't know what certain products have been actually tested to. Um, so that's one of the, the big issues that, um, that we're currently kind of diving into. Um, uh, one one of the kind of suggestions I, I don't know if we're actually going to go with this in uh, the final version of our briefing note, um, but we we like the idea of knowing what installation documents have actually been approved by the NRTL because I mean as it is right now, uh, manufacturers have a lot of different versions of installation instructions but we don't know which version is the one that has been evaluated by an NRTL. Uh, so that, that's kind of where we are at on, on number seven right now. Uh, regarding number eight, are the NRTLs equal in their application of the requirements of UL 2703? Um, I mean, again, it, it was brought up in our, in our discussion earlier that, that CDRs are generally difficult to get. I mean, because of good CRD. reason. We don't want or CD, whatever you want to call them, whatever you want to call them. Um, the doc, I mean, the, the testing reports um, are often difficult to get for AHJs or installers to review, and, and rightfully so, because, um, I mean, it will, um, that will become uh, uh, known to the public. Um, but we, we would like to be able to know um, exactly what certain products have been tested to. Um, so whether that'll be something that can go on the approved installation documents or will go on um, on authorization to mark or certificate of compliance documentation, we just want some way of knowing what a project product has been tested to. Installers, um, generally when, I mean, I'm going to put on my installer hat here, normally when installers uh, go through distribution, um, Distribution companies will just say, here's the authorization to mark or certificate of compliance documentation. It's been listed. And so installers will, from the get-go, assume it's tested. It's, it's compliant with everything. So when we run into um, AHJs that are doing a bit better analysis and actually checking for UL 2703 compliance, um, this can really catch installers off guard. Um, 
we are, we're also talking about um, uh, let's see, giving attention to racking manufacturers that are compliant with all or certain parts of UL 2703, uh, maybe through something like SEAC's website or through CalCIA's website, um, just so that we can actually make it more publicly uh, or make it public knowledge as to which ones are compliant with what portions of the standard. Um, also, training on UL 2703 contents. I mean, those those two presentations from John and Sonny were, were great. And I mean, more of those kinds of trainings um, from NRTLs and manufacturers would be great for AHJs and installers, especially since a lot of AHJs nowadays are not even really checking for compliance with UL 2703. Um, there's, there's just a lot of unknowns there with most inspectors and plan checkers. Um, so that, that's kind of where we're coming from right now. Um, we're still kind of working on the briefing note, and I'd like to apologize to everyone who's in Group C that I wasn't able to send out a, a version of the briefing notes. I got kind of um, waylaid by a bunch of issues um, at work, but yeah. And then in your opinion, Alan, um, how much longer do you think your group uh, needs to spend on uh, the issues to come up with your, or are you kind of ready to, to submit your briefing note? I, I mean, I, I, I can't speak for everyone, but I'd say that if we were able to keep on meeting at the same rate that we were um, prior to prior to SPI, um, I think that another month would be reasonable. I mean, and anyone else in the group can definitely chime in as to what they're thinking. I, I know that a lot are here. All right, yeah, because I mean, that's, that's something we've got to discuss at this meeting is obviously the, the extension to this, um, uh, to, the, to the solution submission and uh, what the other groups uh, feel is a reasonable time. I would have said we could have probably done it in one or two more calls and then possibly a third, depending on how that, that final round of meeting notes came out. But I think everybody on the call seems to be pretty well yeah. organized and on point. So. The group that Hector was talking about earlier, when we got into the details of the lead, so to speak, are we talking about the same 2703? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Well, there's four, there's four task groups. Right. There's two for five, uh, five and six, and there's two for seven and eight. Right. Right. So it, it sounds like what, another three, four weeks? That's, yeah. Okay. So it may, it may not be ready for the next meeting as well. It might. I mean, Group C are pretty far ahead. We, we should be able to hit it. I don't see why not. I mean, in theory, we should all be able to meet once a week or call for about an hour, hour and a half, and then maybe to take a week to, to draft what we think our proposal is and circulate it internally. I don't see why we couldn't hit this in a month. Final right. One yeah. I'm not too sure um, what the activity is. No, no, we we did have one. Uh, We've had we had two conversations, yeah, two. but uh, but the uh, we had uh, backed off simply because we knew we were going to get a reprieve um, a little bit. So, I mean, if if we have until. Uh, and, and we've already talked it out, it's that uh, I have to write down what we all talked about so that we can pick it all apart. But bottom line is uh, I'd look at this and I'd say um, that as long as uh, uh, Friday, oh, i got to specify which month, right? Um, if it was, uh, say, by... Well, you need if you need it by uh, well in time for the for the SEAC meeting on the 24th, right? Well, the, the next. Oh, well, excuse me. I'm looking at the, uh, September. October. Excuse me. Looking at October. Um, is that you need it in time for the 29th? So, if we were to have all of our work done by the 22nd or 23rd, would that be reasonable? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, and then. We're looking at merging group A and D. Why? Sorry? Why? Well, because there's a lot of inactive participants. So, it's, you know, it's, I mean, the group is just not moving ahead. So, um, there's a couple um, who have some you know, instances that they can't participate. So, I would like to merge group A and D. 
Well, I'm going to suggest that even in our discussion, uh, group B, I think it is, whatever it is, the letter it is, um, that when you talk about any one of these items, you really are talking about all four of them. Yeah. yeah. And right. It, it, you can't help but talk, uh, not talk about aspects of all four of them. So I'm not sure why we went to the effort of kind of subdividing it to that degree. That's just a personal opinion. So it's, it's hopefully to get different opinions, get different people in different groups, different discussions. That's fine. It's just that, that, like I said, when you start talking on one of those those four items, it really you're talking about all five. I, I mean, all four. Yeah, that, that'll probably happen when every step to the table. And you have, and, and uh, from the discussion we had today, so this, this is going to be a one of the questions. I'm sure a lot of folks will come up. Looking forward to this. This four items get uh, finalized. Uh, I, I would imagine that some of the questions that come up today will be a and just a general que a comment on, at least from our working group, that I think a lot of it, <laughs> we keep on saying this, this I, I guess it's becoming too overused, the education, 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 or training, 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 is, is that when I hear people say, oh, well, yeah, we need to find this, we need to find that, and, and I'm thinking, I know exactly where I would tell you to look, and if you just looked in these spots and you looked and you read this, then you would have the answers to it, all the questions you're asking. Um, so, uh, I, 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 and, and I, I, we we did we did the speed dating, excuse me, the speed presenting this morning. Um, that that if you kind of take that down at a little bit, just a maybe a half speed, and you actually have something like that out for people to, oh, okay, this is what it's all about. That would that would go a long way. One thing I have to mention is you know, we've got a diverse group here, and we all have our own little world that we deal with. Um, but what we need to try to understand is where other people are coming. Like when like when you're presenting your 2703 issues and Sonny's group is uh, presenting his, they have a background behind it that we don't have. So when we're out in the field or we're in, in doing plan check on solar. We don't have that information. We don't have that background. We can't take the time to go research this and research that. So part of our duties here, I think, is understanding that what other people are dealing with and trying to make life easy for them. Okay, and that, that's the purpose of so we can get this stuff going and, and, and not have to delay it. That's very good. And if any of these issues, the committee passing that section on, on the briefing of the background. And that's where you can bring all the different perspectives in there. So the whole will provide a, a, a thorough understanding of the issues from your side, from EL, UL, whoever, smaller side. So it, so when somebody picks that up, they get a, a complete picture as possible. So they don't have to go and or we well, and Sparky made a good comment in the morning when we first got here. We're not even we're electrical specialists, or at least I am. I think Sparky's got the background there too, but we're talking combo inspectors. They got a plate for us. All right, they tell them, oh, go look on the UL website or go look this up. It ain't going to happen. It just ain't going to happen. And the other thing, too, is, is that we keep on talking about electrical, electrical, electrical. When you're talking about these grounding, and when you're talking about these racking systems, that's one aspect. There also is the structural aspect. There's also the, um, the mechanical and structural aspect, and there's also the fire aspect. Those are not electrical issues. Yeah, uh, you need a you need a somebody that's been a building inspector for years that's also been involved in all the standards, that's been applying it, that's helped develop all this stuff to actually provide some training. If you could find somebody like that, I, I think you could put some training programs together and have them travel around and, and do some training. Maybe, maybe coordinate with IAI. Somebody just I like guess. you. Hello? Hello? Yeah. Hello? Yeah. Yeah. Hello? Yeah. I think I stepped into it. Sorry. Okay. Go ahead. Anybody else online? Any comments? All right. So the, the due date oh. is Paul. So, so we've agreed oh. with um, Chris with uh, Group B. Um, I mean Group C that they need another two to three calls. So I would imagine with with what John's comment was and Chris that by the 23rd of October we should be able to get briefing. Okay, excellent. And then
that you'll know to notify those groups that are emerging. Yeah. So um, you're saying Friday the 23rd. Is that what I heard? Yeah, you said the 23rd. So okay. Just confirming that you were agreeing with that. Yeah. Ah! Right there, <laughs> we are all in agreement with that. Friday, October 23rd. Yeah, I will, I will send out um, a confirmation of that after the meeting. Great. Okay, hi. Hello? Thanks, Alan. Anything else in that item? No, that's it. Okay. Uh, number, item number 10, it says next issues to tackle. <laughs> Trying to keep the momentum going with the meeting, uh, with, with, uh, with the committee. Uh, we're going to, uh, the committee's looked at, looked at AB 2188, with the issues, 4703, and it keeps evolving. So there may be other issues that, that have not been addressed where at 2703. Uh, facilities was mentioned earlier. I think we need to talk about some of the challenges with facilities. And if you go back to when we took, we came, when the committee came up with these 60 challenges and we whittled it down to 11, uh, you have them in, in your board path, and some of these, if you go through some of these, you see that some of them are very general and high level. So please take a look at that. Take a look at what was brought up today with our utilities, uh, maybe energy storage systems, maybe something that you wanted to start looking at. I know, and we're going to talk a little, I want to talk a little bit about that a little bit in, in a second. But there are there specific issues that are not been addressed by other committees, other task force, organizations regarding energy storage systems. You know, Pat had a question about that earlier email. So think about what, what, what should we tackle next? What should we really look at? Should we, should we continue a little bit more in 2703? Something in there, maybe 2188 that's not has been touched on, or some other items. So what, so in the October meeting we, we can at least come up with four more items, uh, specific items. Uh, to look at it. It's got to be specific. If we are too general, then we may be all over the place. John, question? I'm going to suggest that we look at 8 and 11 okay. of the challenges in the next and the next go around, simply because we keep on bringing up about utilities, utilities, utilities. Okay. And both of those items are in regards to utilities. Both of them are in regards to what does a contractor need to know and, and the differences between the utilities. And since we keep on raising it, that seems to be an indication that that's the yeah. issue, the most burning issue. Thank you. That's good. That may also help bring in the bottom of water power here. And it, it, might, help, it might suck them in. Yeah. I know. Hey, we're going to be, the committee's going to be looking at these items, and you guys can pay attention and come and join us. I think we need to uh, focus on the meeting that you have planned for January so we can have something that we can show the public that we've accomplished. Excellent, you know. Um, so items that aren't going to drag on, you know, that's only three, four months away. Right. So something that we can really, you know, come to a finalization on and ensure that we're going to so, so in that light, that's why I'm suggesting that if, if, if February, if you're, and that's a great way to think of it, is, is that if February is predominantly regarding UL 2703 and utilities, those are two major issues, I think, that would be a, 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 your, your points of, of your workshop. And, that, and I think that the 8 and 11, um, those items 8 and 11 from that task, uh, from the, our challenges, our 11 item challenge list, would seem to be a benefit that would draw people to be here because those are two issues they really need to understand and want to know. That number 11, that, that's quite in the apple we get it done. I, I, and maybe it, if it's too big, it, can, it can never be broken down to the more specific. Well, if you notice, if you notice, eight is very specific. That's about the meters. Right. And and eleven was just that. Well, gosh, there's all sorts of things about dealing with utilities that you didn't even know that. And to not, in my mind, eight is a kind of a subset of eleven. Right. And so if you tackle, if you try to tackle both, and you and then you, at least the Help define what you mean by 11. What are the the areas that are lacking of, of understanding? At least, at least to identify those. I think some of the biggest challenges. I'm sorry. Right. Uh, some of the biggest challenges with that is that we're dealing with some different facilities, and we got one here that's a great representation, but it's not everybody. So, you know, that's gonna, that may be a battle. So we do have.
have a representative from Edison we on do. the committee. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, uh, was a difficult family situation, uh -oh. and so, um, so that's pretty big group. Yeah. Yeah. But the pr but the, the point I think, uh, Sparky, is is that you really need to have both the private and the public utilities. So we're, we're trying to find somebody else to implement some next thing. Hector, we might be able to help with that. Okay. Uh, we're having a quarterly meeting with that. Okay. You know, just to update each other on stuff. Uh huh. And, uh, we might have some suggestions. Okay, good. Thanks. All right. If you can let Paul know, that would be great. Yeah. Okay. One, one of the issues that I've seen come up a lot, an awful lot in the last few years with regards to utilities and people saying, hey, how do I get this system through? And this, this is probably more for commercial than it is for residential. Type systems is when a utility comes out and says, "Oh, your system has to be effectively grounded." Have a set of effective grounding with regard to inverters and how all of that works. Completely different from synchronous machines. I think what I'm running, what I've seen a lot of is that the utilities tend to look at a 100 kW generator, synchronous generator, and a 100 kW PV inverter is the same thing. And that's just one item that maybe fits. I don't know if that fits into this. I've heard a lot of people from the, the, the John Wild to whomever talk about it. Okay, so we're, we're taking that down also. Um, so just one other thing, Hector, for February, since we're talking about topics, potential topics or resolutions for February, I think, I think we do have to have something on 2188 in there. Yes. Because I think, I think within that six-month period from now until then, there's going to be a lot of... Oh, yes. Discussion. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't mean to start changing. You're right, because that was our first thing. So if right. we have those three, yeah. and we focus on those three areas, I think it would be well for us in February. Very good. Hopefully, with single inspection at the top, since Pete's not here today. Well, that, <laughs> that's got to that's got to be number one. I mean, that's got to be at least how to address it, right? So, oh, it's possible. That's a good goal. Yeah, to say there, but, uh, right. So. Okay, good stuff. So the October meeting, we'll hold that down to the next four, so that we, we can start working and hoping that by the October meeting, the, the first four, I think between one and eight, we'll have those ready to present to you so we can uh, maybe finalize it then and have a good discussion on, on, on the items five through eight and each other three. Okay, number 11. Get communications guidance principles. Let me see how to bring this up. There was a really, really good email exchange. It was basically two weeks ago. Do you guys remember it? There were two exchanges. There were two. Uh, that woke you up while you were on vacation. It did. I was having, I was having some nice lamb tacos. <laughs> with, and you didn't bring any back? With the, what, what, what are we having this for? Where's the tacos? The lamb tacos? Very unique stuff they make in Mexico. They put it in a bottle and it's kind of golden. Uh, <laughs> that would help us. <laughs> so, but it was actually, I was watching that, that exchange and, and it was actually, um, it was actually quite healthy. Um, and uh, and I, I want to actually commend Pat because uh, I passed something uh, when I look at CX overall. You know, he was facing some committee and he said, I need help. And he could have reached out to anybody. He could have just, uh, or not even reached out at all. Said, hey, I'm going to take care of my own. And he reached out to SIAC. And that was very, very positive. Uh, and encouraged others to do the same. Uh, uh, so if you start doing that, you, other folks start doing that, and then outside folks that are part of the committee start to care about this, then this, then we can, the committee can be very, very effective in coming up with solutions. So thank you, Pat. Uh, just when, uh, just want to caution everybody is, is discussions. If, if some, hey, I, I got something. Uh, yeah, I need help. See, yeah, that's fantastic. You can bring it to the whole group, or just go straight to Paul and me. Uh, but it's, it's, it's with emails that we all know this. <laughs> Having an email discussion, so it, you know, I, I send out emails sometimes, and I get get back to people telling me, Hector, I can't believe you sent that out. I go, I didn't even need that. So, yeah, but that's how it came across. So we just got to be careful. But I thought that was very, very healthy. It really tested the group, and I, you know, overall I thought it was good. And 
what I, one more from what Pat was talking about. Maybe and, and Roy, maybe at the workshop you allow at the very end maybe a I don't know a half hour open forum where you simply you know say to anybody who's attending you know what what is you know this is an opportunity for you to get it out and get it off your chest you know and say what what what's bothering you and then from that we can we could we could take. Uh, oh, so it's, it's we already have identified. At least will help us gauge what is more pressing than sure. other things. I, I do have a, a uh, question. But, but wait, wait, wait. The sure. second, the second one, the second, uh, the, which was like going to be my first one actually. Um, I think that uh, we should be doing it not only in here, but also at that workshop and other workshops, is to have a portion where it's simply a report out of various. Activities that are already being done, not by SPIAC, but by others in regards to solar that have an impact. Sure. For example, uh, I, I presented at the Solar ABC's uh, report uh, at the SPI last last week that I said, okay, here are proposals that are going forward to NSPA one, to IBC, to IFC, to IRC that will be affecting the solar industry. And here's how you can be involved, and just left it at that. It wasn't wasn't getting into the, de the gory details. Just saying, this is this is the topic. This is where, and this is how you can be involved. Or uh, saying, here's these energy storage system uh, task groups. There's this one for the FCAC. There's this one that's over here for NFPA. Here's how to be involved, and just simply to identify these other groups. And like, and furthermore, is is that to have that as a part. Uh, a portion of the SEAC website and with links to those other places so people can go, oh, here's other other resources that I can go to to get that information. Hey, hey John, could we get a copy of that presentation? It sounds very interesting. Uh, again, you're going to have to pay dearly for it. And if you had been at the Solar ABCs, you would have gotten it. But I'll have to figure out some way. Yeah, unfortunately, I was presenting at the same time, so I didn't have the opportunity to be in two places at one time. I think, I think John will find a way to get that to you. I'll, I'll figure it out some way. I don't think we have to remember is what I mentioned earlier, how when somebody brings up a topic and they have an interest in it, their interest may not be the same as your interest. Okay? You all have their business and all these other task forces have their business that they have to take care of in their job, but we may be looking at it from a different aspect. And I'm going to bring up the energy storage for one. I need to know how to permit the now. I know there's task force working on it. I know stuff coming in the future. I need to know how to deal with these now. And I'm not saying I need to know everything, I just need to know how to deal with these now. Yeah. So we have to, uh, I believe you must talk about a little bit, it was helpful. Mm -hmm. or was that something that maybe FBI was, was big help. I talked to some of the, some of the you know, manufacturers down there. So, but again, my concern, you don't want to go down a path that's going to be counter to something that's coming down the road right. very See, quickly. But what we're looking at is from a permit inspection. Okay. Uh, it and still can be effective. It still well, can be, but those are the decisions that we have to make as a jurisdiction, and that's why I'm reaching out. Yeah. Yeah. Give me an idea. In LA County last week, we got 200 permit applications for PV, so we're getting 200 or more per week, and we're not just talking residential. Rooftop, everything, and battery storage is coming in there, so it's just going to go up. Great. Very fast. So, let me, give, let me see if I say this right. So, you don't want to do anything that's in conflict or that later on, you know, if you go in this direction and all of a sudden the task force, task force is going that direction. That's not good. You know what it's equal to? It's equal to what we did before we had UL 2703. We were making decisions on how to do racking, grounding, bonding, and we did it. Right. But we did it as a group. We we would meet in our meetings and say, okay, well this is what we're gonna do. It seems like a reasonable idea. The code doesn't really give you the details for everything that you need to know. And we know UL 2703 was in, in the founding, but it just wasn't there yet. So we had to make decisions on how to deal with grounding and bonding and racking. That's why we did our own test out on scripts here. But we made decisions and we stuck to them. And now that UL 2703 is here and we have more details on, on the requirements, you know, that, the stuff we did before just kind of goes by the wayside. You know, I mean, it was, it, was, it was valuable when we needed it, but now we don't need it here anymore. So, so that should, be, should that be one of the next issues? Tackle, knowing there's other things going on here and making sure it's consistent with, with what the other groups are doing. I think we need to tackle it within within the next year. Okay. 
on, on that same note, backing up just a tad, and I forgot the assembly bill number. I didn't bring a copy of the notice I got. But there's been another assembly bill introduced regarding uh, vehicle charging stations. Right. And um, it, it, it almost mirrors. So can we, can we change the scope of the act to be Solar Energy Action Committee and Electric Vehicles? <laughs> well, <laughs> so what about energy, John? Yeah, I know. I see that. If we, we looked at it, and it, from LA County, it's really, there's no impact. I understand. So take a look at that bill. I don't. I, don't I haven't seen the bill. That's kind of what I bring. I'd like, like to see this bill. It's like 350, I think, Sparky. <laughs> it's, doing, it's doing the same thing as they well, like do. Well, it's not just electric vehicles. It's 2188 centers for energy storage too. So it's it's going to be interrelated. I don't remember the name of the bill. Maybe at the next meeting we'll look it up and discuss what the bill is. Doesn't your legislative committee for ICT and LA Basin chapter track that? I, I know that we're doing that and we're tracking that up in the tri chapters. I, I, I saw whether well, it was a memo or an email from the Calbo representative that just said there was an assembly bill in Calbo. I believe it's 1236. AB 1236 or SB? I, I believe it's AB 1236, and they just basically regurgitated AB 2188 and changed changed solar PV to to electric vehicle, which isn't really going to work because one's a load and one's a one's a power source. So they got a lot of work to do, and they did. They're doing multifamily dwelling on it, and a bunch of people aren't happy with it. And I do agree with Pat that we need to address the the energy storage stuff that's coming. If at a minimum we don't sit down and we aggregate all of the codes. And NEC standards to, or NEC codes and the standards that, that currently apply to uh, energy storage. We could we could put together a pretty decent document on, on guiding AHJs through the process now. Uh, Hector, I do have a good question. Blog. While you're here, uh, since a, since Cal, uh, LA County has already started to implement streamlined permitting for AB 2188, uh, how many permits come across qualify? Is it that 90% level that we thought it would be? I don't, don't know right now. I mean, it's something I have to. I doubt it's signing. Yeah, yeah. It's, we're, we're doing 80% online. Yeah. I, I don't know the number. I'll okay. Get you, I can get you that number later. Yeah, we're just curious to see how the projections of 80 to 90% square with reality. Okay. All right, that's your communications. Thank you. That's an action item, Paul. Uh, yes. Okay. So. Uh, obviously, we're going to continue our progress on the uh, group issues, and um, I will email everybody with regards to merging of the groups and the, the, the agreed uh, deadline for oh. issues five to eight. And then, obviously, writing up the final briefing note. That's also going to be done in conjunction with what we're doing right now, and that'll be a smaller group which will be Don, uh, Chris, and I think we're going to speak to Alan about that as well. Did you hear that, Alan? Yeah. Yep, just did. <laughs> yeah, sure. Well, we'll, be, we'll, we'll be checking in with you. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. And then we continue to work on um, identifying a really good online sort of permitting software, and we'll bring that uh, probably in the next two months to see if we can present, so that's really interesting. And then we're also looking to invite City of San Bernardino to give a presentation on their virtual inspection pilot project. Because that, I mean, County of LA are looking to adopt something similar, right? Yep. Um, and then also to ask uh, for feedback on the operational guidelines so that we can wrap that up at the next meeting. Um, continue our progress on uh, engaging with LADWP. Um, get our logo incorporated that we, we discussed this morning. Uh, Finalise our SIAC message. Um, and then, yeah, the SIAC message is really all about about creating strengthening numbers, finding common ground, and supporting each other. So if we can all agree on the SIAC message, then we can go to market and create our awareness, branding, and, and get all the support that we really need. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, I've got kind of an open question coming from <laughs> my scholar hat towards the inspectors that we have present. As an installer, when we run into a jurisdiction that's not kind of playing ball with, with what we see happening in the industry, 
would you guys be amenable to if it's somebody kind of neighboring where you guys are? Can we try to link up, you know, a building inspector to a building inspector? Because, you know, usually everybody kind of works well within their own scope, right? A lot of the ITC guys play good together. Building inspectors talk with one another. Installers talk with one another. Would you guys be open to trying to sway some of the cities that aren't kind of on board with our current message of SCAC and just as a common ground over to, you know, what theoretically should make sense. And I was talking to Park about this earlier. You know, I have a city currently that's requiring me to do structural and engineering wet stamps and then to have the engineers visit the site and write observation reports for a residential TV system of 13 modules on a roof. It's, it's insane. You know, I, but, from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, there's kind of kind of like a hands-off thing, you know, unless you're unless they're involved in a committee. For right. instance, I, I sit in a committee down in San Diego and it's made up of the city, the county, and various other jurisdictions that reg regularly participate. But there's another handful of jurisdictions in that same area that kind of stay themselves and they, and they don't get involved. So it's hard to it's hard to reach out to those that don't participate. But I think if SEAC can come up with some policies and, and, and that could possibly be in that manner, it's like you know, you can go to your jurisdiction and say, "Well, look, here, here's the act. This is what they decided how they want to deal with it." I'm not telling you, you guys, you have to do it, but these guys are, you know, they're respect and it's a, a forum. And, you know, that's about all I can say. It, there's kind of a hands-off thing when it comes to jurisdiction. Jurisdiction, right. we don't tell you what to do. You don't tell us what to do. Okay. Well, because that's kind of what hinders us usually. Well, you're, well, you're not kind of the he said, she said. So we'll, we'll explain our case. We'll we'll say it is what it is. You know, yeah. you know, it's always nice to say everybody around you does it the other way. You don't know how many times I do an inspection and the common I get is, well, Riverside County lets us do it that way. Right. And, 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 just and half the time that's not true. And half the time it's not true. Now, Riverside County came to me and said, hey, Pat, what do you think about this and this and that? And this is a good reason for me to be involved. Um, then it's different. Then I respect their opinion. They see my viewpoint. But hearing it from a contractor saying, hey, Riverside lets me do it this and this way, that just doesn't happen. Totally. totally. And that's kind of my question is and yeah. if they're to, if if you guys can have that conversation we can say Chris you know we're seeing that elsewhere we we talked about this briefly the jurisdiction the requirement that they're passing on Chris if, if I'm hearing them accurately they're it's, it's pretty out there and if you could you know instead of going over certain people's heads you know if you had a group Identified that you can say, hey, I'd encourage you to call this group because they meet, they talk about these things. Maybe you're not aware of some of the things being discussed um, before we have written material that's actually out there as far as recommendation. If if that building department took the time to make a call, there's not a one of us who would actually discuss it with them. But I think Pat's hitting it right on the head. They're they just can't be bothered, right. you know. We don't need to ask anybody's opinion. We, we know if we're doing, leave us alone. Uh, yeah, I think, I think Solar need, City tried that. I, I think we need, yeah, I was thinking that too. I think we need to be careful that the purpose of this action, the Solar Energy Action Group is to develop recommendations and guidelines not to dictate or advocate or tell uh, anybody who's not following them that they're stupid and they should be following them. I'm, being, I'm cutting to the chase on it. But I mean, but I think that, 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 it's, that it speaks greater when the group, when you have that group of, cons, of consensus that is brought together and, and say, hey, we've got this, it's working for us, we think it'll work for you, and that's about as far as I'd go. Uh, and I just don't see us telling others that well, you really have one particular issue. issue after September 30th they're not going to have a issue. chance anyway yeah it's not an issue right now it is but well to a degree some of the uh, at least in my experience I've gone and done presentations for instance with an IAEI where indeed a lot of times there's more than just you know, there's a community of, of inspectors from different areas and, and there and I've gotten into a lot of conversations and well, yes, shouting matches uh, with people who want 
walk away at the end saying, I'm glad I was here because I heard everybody else's comments. Now, whether they go back and change anything, I don't know, but at least that was a forum that maybe addresses some of what we're talking about. But the flip side point. problem is, though, what Pat pointed out, is it's the usual suspects that usually show up. And there are those couple of jurisdictions regardless of where, whatever region you're in, you're always going to have a couple of jurisdictions that, for whatever reason, for a variety of reasons, sometimes political, sometimes pride, sometimes uh, I don't have time, uh, maybe even once in a while, once in a great while, ignorance, who knows, but there's very reason, various reasons that some people just will not be involved in. You're never, I don't think you're going to be able to persuade them uh, without they just don't they just don't get involved so they're yeah. not made aware of the yeah, but it's but a, the solutions. But a great answer for me is to be able to say if I can reflect them back to this group. Well, well certainly do, I agree. You can, can ahead. You if just I can just say, say hey, hey, you just don't do want to do it like John says. This is the way. Oh no, I, the way I don't want to. I don't want to get into that at all. I want to say hey, right. this is what I see is okay. I I understand you see it a different way. If I could, you know, I'm part of a committee that does X Y Z. Well, if, 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 you, uh, if you want it, you know, here's their contact details. You know, there's there's a lot of, you know, various industry folks from inspectors to, you know, code regulating authorities to installers to manufacturers there, you know, and just give them at least a, a path to a possible. One reason yeah. I will say some jurisdictions probably go the route that you're going is because they don't have the staff qualified. Sure. So they're saying, okay, you get an engineer stamp on everything, at least we're somewhat done. Yeah. Okay. Right. But to address John's comment, I don't think any of us has ever say you're dumb or not, but it's frustrating. I'm sure, and we're just focused now on Southern California, and we're challenged from going from one age state to age to another, because do the same thing all of a sudden, you can't do it. I don't know what Solar City's going through, but if, if you're ever going to make solar a scalable business where you're going to have some national companies, they can't go from one age to age and change their
that those of you around the table in the HJ side, you know that. I've been around for 30, 30 plus years on this. And I know that you, what you've got to do is you've got to provide those guys a, a graceful way out. You can't just, just push them right up into a corner. You can't paint them in a corner. You've got to give them a graceful way out, a nice doorway. You know, now, if they don't take it, then, then you start pushing maybe a little bit more. But, it, but I, I, re, I had this great story just a year ago where some, some permit runner for some major installer, I'm not going to mention who it was, but a major installer went into a jurisdiction and, and put down the permits and, and the, the permits were not complete. They didn't have the installation instructions. And, and they had the cut sheet, but didn't have the instructions. And the, and the jurisdiction was a billing official. She said, could you please provide the instructions? And, and the guy said, I provide you everything you need. And hey, I've got a mandate from the from state of California uh, to, to install PV. So you are going to step out of my way. And it was literally those words. So again, like I said, is, is that, is that it, I, think it's, I, I think it's a wonderful thing for SEAC. I think it's a wonderful thing to put together recommendations. And I, and I also would contend that, and that all uses what, what, uh, uh, what Hector was saying is that sometimes when we write, like you said, we write emails and, and I didn't think I had that tone in there, but somebody else heard it that way. And I think that we just need to, to be, be mindful of how we approach this, that if we, if we beat them over the head with, with you got to do this, you got to do this, you're not going to get as far as if you say, "Hey, you know, we would love to have you along for the ride." And and here's you know, we we we've, we've done all this work, and we'd love to share it with you. And and uh, and I think that I the HJs I know in the room here, you guys actually you like it when somebody has already does it because then you have a lot more comfort because then you're not the one sticking your neck out on your jurisdiction. You're along with a bunch of other jurisdictions. So as long as we keep on that approach, I think that's the best way to go. So the, the challenge is how we write these briefings up. Ultimately, what's going to be published out there, um, you know, factual, good background information. It, it's not just from a single perspective, and that's why we're all, you know, this such a diverse group. And not militant about it. Not militant about it, but at least it's compelling enough. Somebody takes a look at it and goes, wow, that, that, that makes sense. I think what we do is we do the briefing notes and we come up with one note. That we word it so each one is similar to the wording and it's just an opportunity. Any other open forum items? Anybody else? Online, anybody? Excellent content today. Uh, fascinating stuff. I wanted to say I wanted to say I think Sparky nailed it earlier and and it goes along with what Pat was saying when Sparky said earlier about uh, the industry should start making a list of the most common elements that the inspectors are getting wrong or, or, or misinterpreting and then like pass so we, we could then provide the list because I've done that. I've done outreach that people have asked me to do and I would thought I was in a pretty good position to call another jurisdiction and explain you know what I thought the code was and who I was and they, they just don't want to even discuss it because it, 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 like you know like John said it's either ignorance or apathy. The, the difference is I don't know and I don't care but they just don't want to expose themselves and they have that conversation with somebody that, that's trying to explain it to them. They, they, they want to come off like they already know everything and, and it's difficult. So oh, we should maintain a list of the most, com most common elements. It circles us back to the opening comment, which is that, <coughs> is that you know, our focus is on communication, right? Right. Exactly. Yeah. That's it. Communication. I'm just, I'm just I, I, say, Chris. Chris and Mike, we're going to put together a list of the things from at least Solar City and Marengo that okay. we're seeing with inspectors. Good. And we'll bring it to Paula. Thank you. That's really good. I could contribute as well since great. I've got a giant list. Who is that? Oh, that was, that was okay. Alan. Sorry. Oh, no, thanks, Alan. Okay, fantastic. Okay, thanks for the help. Okay, uh, closing. Uh, so we kind of close this up. What worked today? What didn't work? What, was the communication system better? Much better. Okay, good. Yeah. So it would have been terrible to have another meeting with things. Anybody else? 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 Thank you. Um, Thank you.
Yeah. What up, Jim Bailey? Uh, I don't know if you guys met him. It's LA County Fire. He's incredibly knowledgeable. Uh, and if you guys run to Jim, I encourage him to stay on. I'm send the email. Hey, just keep him, keep him here. It'll be fantastic. He's, he's very busy, as everybody else is. But I encourage folks uh, to keep your time. Yeah, I, I had a few emails with, with Jim last yeah. month. So. Anything else in closing? Uh, I, I just want to say that the uh, session, the training session on 2703, I found to be excellent, and uh, I hope we can get John and Sun and others to contribute to the February training on that same topic. Fantastic. More than happy to. I was just going to say on the on the training and stuff. I think if we could hold a lot of our questions to the end, kind of thing, and let them run their presentations it might be a lot more useful okay. when we eventually break it out and publish it so that I think we kind of do kind of go half off topic and usually it's relevant but to let us go through it and then maybe to ask it at the end it might make for better content if we're going to wind up publishing that or minutes or notes from that going forward just as, as far as getting the data back out of it. Okay, good idea. So the next presentation folks, questions towards the end so we can get through them. Go from there. Oh, now you change the rules. Well, you know, it's not too easy. The code of all. I thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you guys. Thank you. Bye, bye. Bye, folks. Read that email, Alan. Come to work. Yep. Saw it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Holy moly. There we go. Let's see.